everybody, and welcome to episode eight of 3MI, Third Man In, the podcast, uh, brought to you by Head Check Health, and I am here with Mr. Chuck Pickett. How's it going, buddy? I'm doing good. Eighth, and, we're getting into it, eh? I know. Two and, hands, and boys. back with us right now is... TR, Terry Ryan here, in the lucky number eight, the game's played for my stat line. There you go. <laughs> hey, let's see, it feels like we've done a lot of shows. It, it does. does. It feels it like does. i played a lot of games. Yeah, it's, good it's, it's to good. have you back, by the way. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. It's, it, it's great here. Um, and what's uh, really good, uh, of course, Terry was away last weekend, uh, so we had a bonus episode. We're actually recording this on Tuesday night, so the bonus episode went up uh, today, but you're probably listening to this hopefully on Thursday. Uh, and uh, we're excited to kind of get into it, because a lot of stuff's been going on in the league. We didn't really, we kind of glossed over it quick mm-hmm. when me and Chuck did our little filler episode in, in case as we, we kind of we was lucky that we did where we didn't get a chance to record until tonight um, and so you know we're just going to get right into things here um you got some stuff already set I, to go. I've got so this is this has been a gift, a Tuesday gift from me for intentional offsides. First off, uh, Terry, great to have you back. I can't explain how many times I looked over to my right. To nobody, it was. Oh, it, yeah, it was really weird because we'd be talking and I'd always be doing this, and there was no one there. And I just the whole time I was in Mike's basement, it looked like I was giving him like shoulder. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, no, I'm not gonna look at you when I'm talking. Uh, anyhow, um, so today, just as just as I was uh, heading here today, I read a report that. Uh, Montreal Canadiens obviously fighting for a uh, very important... Every game right now for them is important. They're fighting for a playoff spot. (laughs) I'm on the record saying I'm rooting for the Habs to make the playoffs, which is controversial for Leafs fan. Claude Julien comes out and uh, benches their, in my opinion, one of their most defensive-minded and defensive-responsible centers, the young kid, uh, Yasberry, I can't say, is it Kotkaniemi? Kotkaniemi? I think, I, is that I, it? I'm, I, well, you also yeah, can't say Sachuk, oh, so I don't really, ch- and, and yeah. you can't say Sachuk, and half enough. of that is your own name. <laughs> like, so let's not, let's not worry about Never mind, uh, I, I scratched that, my new intentional offsides is Michael's treatment of me this week. <laughs> I like it, I'm gonna jump on board, fuck it, that's mine too. Fuck you, Mike. Two out of three, Eight, bam. Oh, there we go. <laughs> but uh, that that was that's my big one. I had some other stuff uh, queued up, but I was just like, "Holy fuck! What are you possibly doing?" Like, and he, and he said it wasn't an injury. He said he he was looking fatigued and ineffective. And I'm, what kind of a message you send it to a 19 year old kid? Your first overall draft choice. He's he's made it at it. You know, he, he, he's fucking 19. Is it though? Is it just some rest though? Is it just straight up just like giving the kids some rest? I, man, I can't I can't see how that's a good call when you're fighting for your playoff lives. Like this is a night in the schedule where not only Montreal has to win, but everything kind of has to go right. For them to hold that spot, like that's not. They're playing the fucking Los Angeles Kings. Yeah, but all Pittsburgh's right, let's not, playing. Columbus is playing. The Hartford Whalers via Carolina are playing. All those teams well, got to lose. Oh, sorry. Um, I nearly mic'd over, knocked, knocked over my speakers while I said sorry. I'm not sorry for cutting you off because it's my fucking turn to speak. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. But um, so there's a couple things going on. First of all, if that's the case, if he really did think, you know what? I'm gonna re- I'm gonna reset here with this kid. Claude Julian seems like a guy that can re- articulate that well. So if that was the case, I'm assuming they painted it with a fine tooth comb or brush. How do you say fine, that? Same? Fine, I don't know. Both I, I, work, they they glossed work. over it with a fine tooth comb. Okay. There you go. They called him in, and I'm guessing just especially the guy, guy seems to have a great attitude yeah. and loves hockey. He's just maybe, smiling all the time. Yeah. Maybe it was a rest. Maybe earlier in the year he called Drew Doughty a fucking cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you know what I mean. There's that, that's how much this box no, could be open. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Um Maybe he's been sick. Maybe he's feeling a little bit down. Maybe in maybe his relative passed away. Right? That's mm. what I say all these things because Claude Julian seems like if this was Michelle Therrien, I'd be wondering. Yeah. I'd be wondering. This or, is why this is yeah. why it was a gift to me. This yeah. is literally why it was a gift. Because but in this case, like he seems to follow all the check check all the boxes for, you know, good young kid, good rookie, and he's a good player. Um, so that could be the first thing. Uh, secondly, Let's. We don't have all the analytics in front of us to support, um, you know, giving. At least I don't. A, a, a non-bias, a, a, an objective view, an objective view at it because I look at it just like you. I mean, I love that player. Um, I think that. I think 
he could play more, <laughs> not less. But, and, you know, I didn't see the last three games either, but go ahead. Yeah, and that's, and well, like, that was the one thing I thought, and it's funny, you mentioned uh, the analytics. Uh, a very, very close friend of mine sent me what I can only, like, it's some sort of, I don't know, heat graph or something. It looks like a fucking weather report, but it was his effective slots on the ice. I, it was way over I, my I head. know, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's yeah. Big, things, big. It literally looked like I thought Eddie Shear was going to queue up, well, like, when I'm getting precipitation, but in, in sometimes retrospect. They're, yeah, sometimes yeah. they're bullshit. Yeah. But when it comes to him or, um, what's it, Peterson on, on Vancouver, two guys that stand out to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm drawing a blank. That's his yeah. name, right? Yeah, Elias that's, Peterson. Um, that's Elias him. Peterson. Yeah. So, uh, two, they, they stand out to me as looking like boys. If there was, a, and I don't mean just facial. I, I mean like they're, 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 they play very well, but it, it seems they still have to grow into their body. So maybe just you know, eighty-two games would be a lot on a guy that size to play. Uh, you know, a junior level, let alone the NHL, and you know, so that that could be another thing. It could be totally legit. Third, he could have asked for it. That's a hot I've seen take. Guys ask yeah, for it. that's a hot, t- and especially I, I don't think he's yeah. played anywhere near eighty-two games before. Yeah, so yeah, and he's at sixty-six games in now. Uh, last year's stats are, are um, his last year's stats are fifty-seven games played. So 57. he's already played more this year than last year at an obviously much higher level. And, and, yeah, and remember, the main reason they have him this year is to learn and be a super fucking star in the yeah. future. It ain't to help the team win this year. It is. It yeah. is in a way, but the main priority is that this guy turns out. Out, okay, we all know what can happen to first round picks in Montreal, right? We all know that shit. And if they, I, I, I'm not looking at this and they should have done this, or I'm, I'm just saying realistically, right? I was a bust. So this guy, they don't want that to happen. They've had that, for, they've had that happen to him in the future more than once. I don't want to name other guys, but there's lots just like me in the Montreal and they're known for it. They're, they don't want the media call him out and handle this guy the wrong way. They want him to play 82 games and then 17 in the playoffs and then be totally junk next year. They don't want him to get hurt. So, it's not only what they want either. The last thing I'll say is that he, I, I just alluded to, he could have asked for it. A lot of people do. They need a break. And I'll delete my tweets calling for Claude Julian to be fired if they well, don't make I, the playoffs. I, no, I, think, yeah, I, just, I could be wrong, but no, I, 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 I think that uh, I, I, I think it's yeah. I think it's a case that you know Montreal was not supposed to be in playoff contention right now. Yeah, that they were supposed to be written off this year. So That's this kid true. getting the call up and getting to play and take on the role and the minutes that he has was supposed to be in a much less. Um, in capacity. a much less, not even less of a capacity, but less pressure situation. Mm. Like this was supposed to yeah. be a year remember, that was basically, it was supposed to be a rebuild. It was supposed to be written off basically. Guys, remember, I, I was same thing. First round pick go in there in the rebuild year, the same thing that they had. It wasn't always sour. They had me there. I played three games in 96, 96 and they told mm. me I wasn't going to play a lot. They rather mm. me practice in the NHL than play most of the year in junior. So I went back at the very, very end, but that was another part of it. So, you know, it could be the same mentality on a relative level. And, um, uh, outside of that, there's all I know about the situation. I can speculate. All I know, mm-hmm. I know Claude Julian is a pretty good coach who has a history of treating his players with respect. I know the Montreal organization is a first class organization. Mm-hmm. I know that Bergevin got a lot of shit and doesn't want to get any more shit and he got this guy clicking he got the team clicking everything I know about the situation would make it absurd for them to walk in and say sit the fuck down yeah. you know so I'm just earing on the side of logic logic I think yeah. I, I and think. it's funny because it, it, driving here and I literally read this on like five minutes before I got my car um uh, I was just leaving fixed and bought a coffee. <laughs> but dr- driving here, the thought literally never occurred to me that uh, Claude Julian, well, one, it definitely didn't occur to me that he could have asked for it. That's a, you know, but it never occurred to me that he, you know, sat down with him and said, listen, kid, you're coming. Because I'm not, I haven't fucking played hockey. I never, you know, that, and that's obviously how things work. I just, <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes. Most yeah, times. Not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you fucked up or you played like shit and you're 27 years old, might be a little different. But just knowing what I know, I mean, you know, Ryder, Michael Ryder doesn't talk a lot. Though, and he's a friend of mine. Ryder played for him more than once. Yeah, I mean, and, Ryder followed Julian around. Yeah, and years. riders told me, like, point being, 
I don't talk to Rides about many things. Mm-hmm. One of the things that he chose to talk about was Claude Julian and how good of a guy he is. Yeah. Uh, to me, and, and Rides was in that position. He was like kept down. If not for Julian, he might not have got up. Yeah, um, you know. I mean, and that was that's been a long said thing that uh, mm. you know um, Claude Julian, um, you know, w- was a big part of Michael Ryder's career. Yeah, and, and we know that because it's here. But it, it could have been all kinds of other players. Oh yeah, yeah. And right, I mean, so. the, yeah, I'm sure Michael Ryder's not the only guy who got given yeah. that chance. But I mean, he was obviously the highest profile one for us. And the, being in Newfoundland and being the case of like he played yeah. for him in Montreal, Julian left, Ryder's dropped off a little bit, followed him to Boston, picked back and up. Not again, only and that, now. Julian had Ryder in junior. Yeah. Right? So, junior, when I played with Ryder in the minors, we had him in the East Coast League. He didn't even make Fredericton. You got, I'm not saying that he shouldn't have. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying he shouldn't have been there. I'm saying he should have been, and he, and he would have outscored me. Mm. The guys, but Julian had him, and Tyrion was there. When Tyrion left Montreal and I left and all that, I shouldn't say left, but when, when Tyrion, he was my coach in, in the minors, right? When I left, he got called up to Montreal while mm. Rides got, went from the East Coast League to the AHL. Mm-hmm. And then you started not, you couldn't ignore his stats. Then when he gets up, he gets 30. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, you can't ignore those. So Julian helped him along, but along the way, there was a lot of articulating thoughts in the back room with Michael. You know, saying, mm-hmm. "Michael, I know you can do this. Now, here you go. Work on this. Work." On, I know for a fact that Julian is at least a communicator. Mm-hmm. So it would really, really surprise me if he just was pissed off, threw down his fucking chalkboard, and <laughs> said, "You know, fuck that." Yeah. Or, All right. Anyway, uh, glad, glad I glad I got that one. That was uh, yeah. Glad I got that oh, one. No, I've been in I'm gonna position, just, I guess. I'm gonna remove intentional from my notes. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, what what I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna move into because uh, I know Tr. We're trying to to get along. We got we're talking to Darren Colburn tonight. We're trying to get to that, and Tr has, does have to take off again. Quick following that. Um, so just to get through this while you're also here I want to talk about my oh baby moment of the week which also just happened today which is Brad Marchand being like total like he's moved on from being an on ice troll to just being an internet troll now because he tagged NHL PR the Toronto Maple Leafs and Mitch Marner in a tweet that says I can't wait to see this kid's new deal 12 million AAV it better be hashtag Marner watch like he threw it out and I'm pointing at it right here and he's gonna he's gonna regret this he's gonna I mean it's 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 you know How's he going to regret just, it? It's, 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 you don't, you know, you don't you know fucking why, think that Marner has that printed off in his booth already? I think he should. Regre- he will regret it for this. Re- it's not always. It's it's. There's some about people say ghosts of the forum. For example, that was karma. Or I guess if you believe in fucking ghosts and hopscotch, that nonsense. But like. It's normally karma, and you get in there, and you know what? A lot of times, that was teams going in going, oh, my God, I'm in the Montreal Forum, and there's Guy Lafleur, and there's Larry fucking Robinson, and they got four cups in a row, and what the fuck do I do now? Years later, this is Patrick Waugh, this is Mike Keane, this is Bob Ganey, what the fuck do I do? It's more of that. So when you put that shit out there, a lot of people would hope that you get a fucking stick in the face. A lot of people... <laughs> I think said, they hope that I'm Rashawn anyway. For, yeah, maybe. Yeah, no, but but I, for, I for me, it's just that you put it out there. Well, it's just like... Why? Now you're playing against Toronto and you got every reason to fail. Like it's just for me it makes his 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 mouth put his whole team into a fucking pickle. Why pick something? Even though it's only small now, if all of a sudden, if I'm on that team and that little fuck's going around, because he's not going to finish it, he might pick his spot, but you want him on the ice. So you don't even want him to fight if you're the coach or the guys on the team. So some guy's going to have to come along and get his fucking knuckles dirty because he's decided to go on Twitter in the afternoon one fucking Thursday. Like, but, does- but that's the thing is, I don't, like, I think it's a great kind of trolling because I don't think it's, like, I think if any, I think he's being sincere in that like Mitch Marner right now is leading the really? in scoring. I think Brad Marchand. <laughs> I you think, think he's wish. being sincere. They're, that's I'm, one of their. That's one of their biggest rivals. You think he's going to be giving a kiss in front of the net and say thank I, you for scoring for for getting that contract? He actually, we love you. He actually would. Um, I wish you but, guys could have seen Tierra's face. But when I think I honestly think up. I honestly think this is a case of Brad Marchand and he's stirring the pot. Don't get me wrong, he's fucking okay. stirring the pot. But he's doing it by like pointing out Mitch Marner's a hell of a fucking hockey player and based on how he's playing compared to how they play he's other doing people, it because he people all around North dollars. America are having this exact debate and he knows people are talking about him 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 and he loves it and they're gonna go am I am I trying to piss him off or am I giving him respect the answer like you said he's stirring the pot either way it's mm. a stupid thing to make even if he's fucking pumping his tires if I'm on the team I don't want that shit I don't want to get to the rink and find out what who tweeted what now what the fuck's going on tonight who tweeted who tweeted <laughs> you know it's just stupid <laughs> 
You don't need to bring anything into and the game other than you and the players on your team. You're going into the next game. Even even you know who, who's the captain? Uh, Chara. Yeah. Jerry, that should go through him first, that shit. If you're going to bring that on and you're going to bring something public, Zidane, oh, I'm going to do this. You think it's a good idea? Because it's going to directly affect when we play them the next. I think it's a fucking bonehead move. I, it, it, to me, it reminds me of, of, of uh, so Haley Wickenheiser, uh, yeah. that famous quote, uh, they had our flag on the dressing room floor. Yeah. I want to know if you want us to come sign it. To me, that's already on a bulletin board or hung up in Mitch Marner's booth summer at one. He's not going to make $12 million. Uh, They're going to sit him out until December 1st. TSN is going to be insufferable. Uh, Twitter is going to be insufferable. But anyhow, that's printed off somewhere. And uh, a lot of people uh, will tell you, beware of giving away bulletin board material. That's bulletin board material. So I'm going to leave that. I agree. And yeah, you know man. what? If they put it this way. If I had to think about it as an opponent and it's Brad Marchant, I guarantee you, you can tell I worked on by him, mm-hmm. I would line up and he wouldn't get... I, he wouldn't get five feet away. I'd grab him. If he didn't fight, I'd just start fucking... Cause it's, <laughs> and I'm not that dirty. I wasn't that guy. Mostly, I'd have a bone to pick and someone would... And maybe he would. Maybe he would fight me straight up. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying that right there, I don't know. I don't want to have to interpret and assume what you said. I don't give a fuck. Did you say something publicly and tag my player that people are fucking debating about? Because if you did, here's my Sherwood. Eat it, you motherfucker. Eat it. I would fucking have him for lunch. I wouldn't give a fuck. And I think he's a little... Uh, shit disturber I'd still as I say this I'd still have him on my team <laughs> I like the way he does but, yeah. he would, but he would have to, like someone if I'm the captain today i talk to him I'd love to have him because look how what worked up he's getting me yeah. he'd yeah. probably throw you off but yeah. but but if I'm the Leafs now if I win I'm go mm-hmm. now it makes mm-hmm. it sweeter and to mm-hmm. me it just sets you up for fucking disappointment mm-hmm. anyway. uh, to me I find this is the I'm going to call this right now uh, this is the PG-13 version of uh, that Sean Avery comment um, on, on, on yes. I don't, I don't gotta think call it. I gotta call it. I don't think it's the same thing gotta call it. Okay. Oh, All God, right. Avery. Right. Oh, fuck. <laughs> he says that, it's over. I'm, I'm serious. He might beat me, too. I'm, I just know I'm saying my rage. Mm. If if Sean Avery had said that, um, and you know what? I'm not going to say what it was. You look it up on the fucking yeah. internet. Yeah. Yeah. We, know, yeah. we know what it was. If yeah. he had yeah. said that, I would fight him next game if I was on any team in the league. How yeah. about that? But not just the Leafs or not just at the time Calgary. Mm. I would, because... I thought that was so far off sides and out of mm-hmm. bounds. And you're in a union. I, you're in a yeah. union and try to be, you're, you're supposed to be all working towards the same goal. That would be over, I'm telling you. There I would hurt rumors. him too if I had to. There were I rumors. Could. Sorry for cutting you off to you, brother. There were rumors and, and everything was afloat that when they met up that next game that they were going to sit for enough. There were rumors, and I remember reading about it on. I, I'm not gonna. I'll, I won't out. I remember. The, I won't, yeah, yeah, I won't out the website I was reading it on, but I'll say E4. <laughs> and anyway, yeah. there were rumors that they were gonna sit Dion Phaneuf because they were actually afraid that he would get a misconduct or, or you know, yeah. which is several, more. Yeah, more the sev- reason that I fucking games, can't stand it. Yeah. But the entire time I was thinking of that, so I was like, this is going on 10, 11 years ago. Mm. I was thinking, how insane would it be if he, like, all of his pitching was giant Phaneuf chasing after Avery in his uniform while Phaneuf is in a suit because he's in the yeah. fucking press box. Yeah, well, also you watch right? my buddy Darcy Tucker. Oh. Darcy Tucker wouldn't take shit from that guy. He fought him two or three times. They went at it in warm-up more than uh, once. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Tux, well, Tucker also Tux is like bench. me. Tux is a shit disturber. Um, but Tux is doesn't disrespect, especially when the game ends. Like, he's just... There's a slight difference. It, Tux would never, ever come out and say what Sean Avery said. Oh, yeah, no. But anyway, I, you know, I know he's, I'm... I'm, I'm, sub, uh, I'm I put you guys on that rap. Here's, here's what we're going to do, is we're going to calm Terry down and, <laughs> and have him talk not about all these people that he's so angry about, but have him talk about someone he likes, okay. which is Mr. Darren Because I do have to leave. Will uh, have come and, up. Thank you, Mike. Um, and, and you know, I, I have to leave because I went to uh, Tri City, my old junior team, this weekend, which we will talk about. We in will. Next we'll week's talk episode. about that uh, in the next episode. Yeah, but that's why we're late this week. I'm sure everybody knows that by now. I will have tweeted out tomorrow, which still would be in the past when you hear this. So, um, 
uh, uh, Chuck, but before I get to that, did you have one more yeah. thing to ask me? Terry, I got to oh. ask you, uh, the last time we recorded one of these with you, um, you were you, you oh, were yeah. on the way to a game to play Clarenville. And oh, right, I, had, right. I had at least like a dozen people message me and were like, hey, how'd Terry make out? Because we Terry? had said it was the end of a, uh, almost yeah. three hour episode. And yeah. we said, if you get to the end of the episode, let us know uh, as a code by asking <laughs> us how a TR did in his game. And neither one of us knows how you fucking did yeah. in that game. Oh, uh, cool. Do? Okay. It was, a, it was a great game. We lost in an empty net to Clarenville who won the uh, Allen Cup a few years ago um, and, and they're a great team with some of my great buddies but um, that has nothing to do with it I guess but we won on Friday I think was it I, we won one and they won one I can't remember which day I was in here I, I'm assuming it was Saturday, Saturday but it's yeah. great and now we're playing them in the playoffs so the worst thing about going to Tri-City last weekend was that I was supposed to play games although you know Tri-City were honoring me and I'd do it a hundred times over I wouldn't miss games for much but I had this plan for a while and we're down two games to nothing now two Clarenville so game three is Friday night in Twin Rings game four is in Clarenville on Saturday so uh, for senior hockey players my phone buzzing there for any senior hockey players or fans I guess fans that um, or fans of the show that are listening come out and watch it's a great brand and um you know, I'm going to be playing and uh, ready to get some revenge on my old uh, team, the Clarenville Carboos. Thanks so, for asking. So if you're around on, on Friday night, it's Twin Ranks. And if you're there in the is. Clarenville area on Saturday, Game 4 is there. And then where's Game 5 when it happens? Yeah, well, so if, if Game 5, then I believe we're going to play it out in Clarenville. We when? started because due to, uh, due to you know, the event, Clarenville Event Center being available, um, mm. be, availability would be that word. <laughs> um, we started in Twin Rinks, but we're going to go back to back in Clarenville if, uh, should, should there be a game five. All and, right. uh, so that's that. And now I do have to take off. You guys keep going, but I'm going to explain who our guest is this week. Um, and, uh, a lot of people, I think Darren Coburn, even when we were, when I told him he was going to be on, he said, are you sure you want a B-lister? Um, B Lister because he played in the East Coast League, I guess. Um, and Darren is a, I often call it the curious case of Darren Colburn. Um, he had a lot of goals in junior, very, very humble guy. He'll probably tell you that he didn't deserve to make the NHL. If I know Darren uh, the way I do, that's what I think he'll say. But, uh, you know, 50 goals in, in the OHL, uh, twice or close to twice. And then he went to the East Coast League and had uh, 69 goals twice. And he only got up for a game here or there. I think he played two or three games in the American Hockey League. One of them, he had a goal and assist. Uh, just legendary. And so first of all, statistically, I thought he should have played higher. So that's the first reason you want to talk to Darren Coburn. The second, he's a two-sport athlete, one of the best baseball players that this island has ever seen. And uh, a lot of people aren't up with Newfoundland baseball, nor should you be. But just take it from me, he goes to the National. Darren to sum it up, was offered more than one scholarship to go and play uh, baseball. So it's an interesting story from that point of view as well. On top of everything, he was a real character. So Darren has a lot of stories. Darren would be the guy, just like myself, to stay in the dressing room and have a couple more beers. And, uh, you know, the first one in the morning, in with the donuts to hear when guys come in, you got any stories, got any stories? It becomes story time with Darren. And uh, I played four years senior hockey with him. So I, I, you know, I, I always looked up to him. He's a few years older than me, and probably the best natural scorer, one of them. I know you can't discount NHL guys, but he's definitely one of the best natural scorers the island has ever seen, and pro hockey has ever seen. He's in the East Coast League Hall of Fame, and I believe he has the most goals or close to ever in in the in the coast, having played a lot less games than a lot of people. And uh, he's an interesting cat. We joked about the Cy Young Award. Darren usually gets more goals than assists. Um, more than once, he's had 50 goals and not 100 points. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, these are all things that make him unique. And he's a good, fr- a good friend and he's a great storyteller. Um, and I'm kind of excited because he was one of those few pro, pro players at the time that you might have heard of that played ro- pro roller hockey. And that was huge for a while. Uh, he played on Team Canada in that. He played in Scotland. He played in Germany. So, you know what? We, we weren't going to have a guest this week, and uh, I've been talking to Darren lately, and I really think he's good for the show, and I don't think he's a B-lister at all. I think uh, just if we're counting leagues here and everybody listening to the program, because it's so vast and it covers so much area, and we're getting thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of listeners now, so everybody won't know exactly who Darren Colburn is, but look it up. Look at his hockey DB. One of the nicest people you'll ever, ever meet as well. And I think he got fucked in his career, although he wouldn't always say it. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave it there. 
I'm gonna leave. I'm not gonna ruin anything else. I'm gonna let Darren Coburn tell his story, and uh, he also likes the app. So I bet you were probably here more than twenty or thirty minutes. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> All right, and so we will talk to Darren Coburn right afterward from our sponsor, Head Check Health. Concussions are serious business. Concussions and post-concussion syndrome had a huge effect on my career. Whether you're a player, a concerned parent, a coach, a risk manager, or an executive, they're a major area of concern. HeadCheck Health has developed software and services that improve the way concussions are assessed, tracked, and managed at all levels of sport. Their goal is to create a safer environment of play by giving better tools to the individuals responsible for documenting and assessing concussions and providing better data to administrators to make real health and safety improvements. Improvements. Head Check currently works with organizations across the country like the Canadian Junior Hockey League, BC Hockey, Rugby Ontario, the Western Lacrosse Association, and more to advance their concussion management practices. If you're interested in learning more how Head Check can help your team or organization, please visit headcheckhealth.com or email info at headcheckhealth.com. That's headcheckhealth.com or info at headcheckhealth.com and tell them TR sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, this week I'm honored to have a good friend on the program. The former Oshawa General, Cornwall Royal, Cornwall Royal, Acadia Axman, Binghamton Ranger, Kalamazoo Wing, Dayton Bomber, Richmond Renegade, Peoria Riverman, St. John's Maple Leaf, Rally Ice Cap, Scottish Eagle, Augusta Lynx, San Jose Rhino, Anaheim Bullfrog, Car- Clarenville Caribou, and most importantly, Cornerbrook Royal. And Canadian national team for two games. So this is Darren Colburn, ladies and gentlemen, a good friend of mine. And uh, welcome to the show, Darren. <laughs> Thanks, TR. And, uh, uh, bit of a suitcase introduction there. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> that is a lot of frequent flyer miles right there. <laughs> it, well, it really is. And it, this is the thing. I, I wanted to, I start every show like that, but this one especially, because I want people to know Darren's story. Uh, Darren, I, I affectionately call it the curious case of Darren Colburn over the years. <laughs> um, when Darren first left, for out, I, I just kind of, spoke about this on the way in but uh, some people just tuned in for the interview so you'll get the short version right now so Darren um, in my mind is one of the most underrated players for Newfoundland but you could you could outstretch that to players of all time that played in the minors and I'll tell you why Darren goes to the OHL I don't know what happened we'll get into this in a second Darren but uh, you know you go to the OHL the first two years with Oshawa and you do okay you seem to play the year out but single digits not like you were ripping it up then you go to Cornwall, and you you start really coming on fire. And those teams had, I'm not looking at anything. I just remember from your stories. I know John Slaney. I know Owen Nolan. Uh, who else might have been on those teams with you, Darren? Well, you talked about him uh, with um, with Mark O'Brien, Matthew Schneider. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so we he, had Schneider, Schneider and Slaney on the power play, so it's not a bad Imagine thing. that, Darren. So you're up there. Not only are you honing your skills, but you're playing with these guys. And, again, Owen Nolan went second overall one of those years. Um, you, you're playing with these guys, and you know you're thinking to yourself, "I'm a young player. You're 19, 20 at the time. How do I? What do I do to get ahead?" You get drafted. where, are 11th round, I think. Yeah, I was a steal in the 11th. Yeah, in the 11th to Detroit <laughs> after 227th overall. After yeah. getting guys and look at his stats, they're incredible. So Darren goes to Acadia and, and is an All Star in Acadia. Now, now the, the interesting thing, guys, the interesting, and we'll get into all this. I, I just glossed over that for a second because. The interesting part to me is Darren goes to the East Coast League, okay? And, you know, who knows? And we're all rooting for him. Darren, I, I knew Darren before he went down from baseball more than anything else. But, you know, we're, we're looking and following along. This is why it's very dear and personal to me. Darren gets 69 goals twice, nearly 70 goals. Now, the first thing when I say that, you're going to say, well, what kind of a fucking league was that? Um, <laughs> you know, where was he playing? Well, it was the East Coast Hockey League. It was so long ago, though, that a lot of people don't realize. They might say, they might look at those numbers and go, ah, well, it was glorified junior B or But it wasn't. It wasn't glorified senior. It wasn't glorified, glorified anything. It was a good league. Darren was the leading scorer. And yeah, and I'm looking at the two years he got 69 were in 64 and 68 games. So yeah. More than a goal, not even a point a game, a goal a game. Would have had 70, no problem. Okay, so we can say that goes on now here's the interesting thing right now Darren's a Hall of Fame East Coast League member one of the leading scorers of all time for that league and, and had he played longer he'd guarantee be the leading scorer so Darren gets called up now this is what we're going to get into Darren you get called up after having such a successful start to your career at this point you're midway through I guess you get one goal and one assist and who, who's that Binghamton 
Yeah, I got called up. We uh, we one left one game. Playoff. One game, yeah. And you got one goal and one assist. Now, just yeah. explain that game, and then I'm going to go back to the introduction. Go ahead. Well, what happened was uh, that was after my first year. I was rookie of the year in the ECHL, and um, my coach uh, Claude Noel at the time. No, said, I oh. fucking love Claude. I miss Claude Noel's press junkets when he was, wow. from when he, his pressers when he was with the fucking Jets were like my favorite thing. <laughs> I've heard this the story in the dressing room over beers. I funniest, forgot that this is the yeah, funniest funniest man in the world. Like we called him Gumby. He was just his head was all over the place when he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Claude said, Jesus Christ, he said, you score 69 goals. I got to get you to go somewhere. So he calls Ronnie Smith, who's in Binghamton, who's a good friend of his from the old, old OHL. And he said, uh, I got a kid here who is uh, scoring, rip, ripped it up this year. We're done with the playoffs. Would you like to have him? So I get sent to Binghamton. So I pack up my shit, go to Binghamton, and uh, I arrive on, and this is the New York Rangers farm team. This is the Binghamton Rangers. So they've got Dougie Waite. they got all these kids that are sitting there, and they're all waiting to play. Don't we get into the fucking finals, and I fucking, I'm playing game six. No. Over, wow. over no. They pull out Ross Fitzpatrick, who was the all-time leading scorer for the fucking Binghamton Rangers, <laughs> and they put, they put me in the lineup. What was your stall and like I'm, in the dressing room when you went there? Was it a, was it a warm oh, welcome? Oh, was, well, no, you know what? You know what I remember the most? Was it that? was the, fuck, the smell of the warm-up jersey. Beautiful. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. That's, this, is, this, is, this is the New York, New York Rangers. Oh, other this than is the, other than Toronto. Plus. Oh, my, just money coming out of their ass, right? Yeah. yeah that's and great. I'm like, I, I love that. As soon as I, soon as I stepped in there, they give me a, 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 an envelope full of cash, and I'm like, "What's this? Oh, that's your per diem while you're here for the next two months." And I'm like, "Holy fuck! That's more than I made in the last three months." <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it was incredible. But again, those are little things that. But again, yeah, I stepped, I scored, and that's what I did. And uh, I played with a guy named Mike Stevens and uh, Chris, yeah. Chris. Chris Chichaki, his name was, and Mike Stevens was a setup guy. Chichaki or Chichaki was a, was a, a tough, not a big guy, but just a typical uh, corners guy. All I did, I went to the net. And I can remember the goal in the regular season. I scored uh, one, and then in the playoffs, I scored one. So, so Darren, but it, these are on like in the regular season. It was one game. You get one yeah. game, one goal, one assist after sixty nine. Like, how did you not start the next year? In an NHL camp with an AHL contract. I, that's that, what I don't understand. That was my own fault, and I'll admit that. Uh, I, I left Binghamton that, that year. You know, at the end of the year, Terry, you go in for your uh, year-end meeting with the coaches and the, yeah. and the GM. They were all sitting in there, and they said, well, man, we'd love to have you back. We'd love to have you back to camp. We can't guarantee a contract, but we'd love to have you. Uh, so I said, okay, I'll see what happens over the next couple months with respect to a contract. I ended up taking or settling for a minor league contract with Peoria. Okay. So anyway, that's that's where it, it ended up. So I, I said, you know what? I'll take what I can get. If I had waited, I probably could have gotten to Binghamton, could have done the same thing that Langer did, uh, you know, played for a couple of years, whatever. No, then it's in your own hands. But you're not battling out in the ECHL. Right. Well, but, yeah. Right? And, and Darren, well, if, but didn't, but you, didn't have say that's your have fault. you modestly say that's your fault, but it's not like uh, your fault to me is like if you, I don't know, man, you, you pissed off the coach, told him to go fuck himself. If you stay out of yeah, if that's you, what I thought was coming there. That's yeah. when you said I sat down and the coach and the GM were there. Right? I was just like, Ooh, 69 goals. Where's this go? Yeah. yeah. No, well, you no, figured, no. You know, humble, it's not really humble. your fault. No, humble. I was very humble. And I said, guys, thank you so much. I'd love to come back to Binghamton. Um, and again, I was at, at the same time, uh, guys, I was going, I was, this was my third New York, or sorry, my third Detroit training camp. So oh. when I got drafted in 88 in Detroit, just, they didn't sign me after my last year junior, my overage. They said, I said, I'm going to go to college, uh, see where that goes. Um, I played two years at Acadia, not one. So okay. hockey DB is wrong. I, I had a great year in 1991 and, uh, I, said you know what yeah, i just there's nothing there for 1991 no and whatever what, whatever happened happened but i scored 30 odd goals in 90 90 91 and i said holy in fuck, what in how many games 26 20 oh. fucking six yeah see because so, you should have been playing in the american hockey league that whole time i don't know darren i know i'm jumping in here if there was a knock on you i think it was skating my knock on me was skating I, if i want even you know for those that don't know i played uh, three or four years with darren colburn in senior hockey and darren led the league most of those years we had a cannon on him but if i was to watch the i don't know how many people came to watch us play and said 
geez, I didn't really know who Coburn was. I look at the score sheet. Jesus, he's got four goals. Um, it was one of those things. I'm not knocking you when I say it, um, but no, I, sure. I would think that would have been the only thing to possibly keep you out of the NHL. And people are laughing now. No, I'm serious. There's no way this guy shouldn't have been an AHL. Or I mean, you look at those stats. So, Darren, my next question before I get too far ahead, you just mentioned Darren Langdon. Please, so people who don't know now, because a lot of our listeners are junior hockey or a little bit older, some might not know Darren Langdon. He retired about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Darren is one of the toughest players ever, it, definitely from Newfoundland, but he, he's um, uh, just one of the toughest from Deer Lake, and, you know, he's, he's got simple tastes. Darren likes his beers, likes ball hockey, likes hanging out with the boys. And then all of a sudden, one day, I knew he was playing senior hockey, and I heard because he'd gone to the Maritime Junior League and done pretty well. I think he'd led his team in scoring. So I always knew of Darren Langdon as well, but not like Darren Colburn. To me, Darren Colburn was the best scorer that I knew from Newfoundland. And then all of a sudden, two years later, I'm watching, and Langer's fighting Bob Probert for the Rangers, and he's played. I, I couldn't believe what happened. So take us, because I know you had a big part of that, Darren, and explain, please. So after after my first year, uh, I got rookie of the year, and uh, Claude Claude Noel said he said, "Is there anybody back home that's worth coming down with you?" He said, "We've, we've got one of you, so why not? Let's get uh, as many as we can." So I went back over the summer, and I and I talked to, to Flaps, we call him Langer, and uh, he was interested. So he and I, after I had signed with Peoria, he and I went to Peoria's uh, IHL training camp, full full knowing that we were both going to end up back in Dayton with Claude. Yeah. So. Darren, Darren and I, uh, we were, you know, good buddies, and uh, we, we were roommates going in the in the Peoria's training camp, which was the IHL at the time, and. Um, Langer basically was a walk-on. So he was a walk-on in Peoria's camp, had no expectation whatsoever to make the team. He knew he was going back to Dayton. I at least had a contract with, with Peoria. I may could make so the big So you team. had to clock a contract, wow. and he yeah. didn't. And he didn't. So I here we are. Okay, so here we are, roommates. So we're both going in blind because neither one of us had been to Peoria. I got signed out of because uh, Peoria saw a lot of our games the year before. They were We were St. Louis's uh, ECHL ah, team. Okay. Dayton was P- belonged to St. Louis. Peoria was the a- uh, the IHLs. So back in the day, boys, not everybody had an AHL, ECHL, IHL team. Your the IHL was an older pro league. The AHL was more the younger pro league. Yeah. So Peoria was the right. Peoria was in the eye. So anyway, we went to camp, and Darren was going in, and everybody knew he was a tough kid. And the poor bugger, he was. They were lining up left and right to say, "Well, we're going to figure out how fucking tough this kid is." <laughs> so, so right which, off. Which, the by bat- the way, not to cut you off here, just for a second though. Which people got to realize, like back when there was more fighting and everything on the go, most people, even fighters, had a crazy resume. Now, we all know Langer's tough. He played in the Maritime League, but, you know, that wasn't heavily scouted at the time. Even right now, you know, you get some no. college. But, like, that was it. So he's coming yep. in, and everybody that you're going to mention that's even going to fight him are already have some kind of resume and are expected to beat him. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Keep going. Well, no, definitely. Like here's a kid that comes. Well, Flaps is probably 20 years old, coming out of the the Maritime Junior League, playing with. He played uh, a little bit of senior in Deer Lake, didn't he? Or was that well, before? No, was that no, when he was 16? No, no, he played friggin' Grenfell College against uh, <laughs> in the college league or the intermediate league here when he was 16. Oh. And had, Jesus. And had a good scrap with one of the tough Steve Dunn, who your father coached. Yeah, I remember Steve. And uh, uh, Langer fla- uh, tapped him up for uh, for fifty smacks in the face uh, back when he was sixteen. But anyway, this kid walks in and he goes out there and he had his chin strap done up and it wasn't even cut off. I mean, the loop on the chin strap was hanging down to the top of his shirt. And the guy began, "This this guy is fucking goofy looking. He can't be tough." Anyway, the toughest guy in camp. His name is Bob. Here's the guy's name: Bob the Hammer. Fl- Fleming. That was his nickname. <laughs> I've, I've heard stories about this guy. <laughs> this guy here looked like um, uh, Yosemite Sam. He had the he had the mustache down to the, below his chin, oh, no. and it was just hanging off. Anyway, he skates up the flanger at the first. This is scrimmage. It's like we're not even started playing yet. We're not doing anything. This is like a <laughs> scrimmage. Go boys, drop the puck, and no referees. Anything. So Bob the, Bob the Hammer goes up next to him. He goes, "Let's go, punk," and just drops his gloves and says. Okay, and Langer basically in three punches hits him in the forehead, hits him in the nose, hits him in the chin, and the guy goes to the ice. Wow! <laughs> oh my. So immediately, immediately now, immediately. He just, didn't, 
he didn't realize that this guy was, you know, he was he was ready to go. So anyway, Fleming gets up and he goes, "Fuck this! I'm we're going again right away." Like, I mean, <laughs> after not, I down, guess no reps. No refs. What are you going to do? So there's a couple older guys saying, yeah, stay back. Let, let him go. Let him go. Sure enough, Langer ties him up and fucking embarrasses him again. And this guy just skates off. He had the, the tape right up to the, you know, the, the old guy t- tape right from the ankles right to the fucking below the shins. And <laughs> just stumbles off, and, and that's it for the day for him. And Langer just, with his helmet still done up, just skates off and... Okay, I'll just wait now for the next shift. And sure enough, someone else fucking comes after him and same thing. So there's no there's nobody getting kicked out. It's just fight, fight, fight. And oh, yeah, okay, those days. After, after day one, he was number one. So was, Langer entered the Royal Rumble, you're telling me. Basically. So, so it was, yeah, I was like, so did, did they take away uh, Bob's nickname, The Hammer, after that? Like after not one, no. but two times going down? No. Uh, Charles, you know what's funny? Is that poor Bob got sent down to Erie. And Langer ended up playing against him in Erie because we were in Dayton. So Lang- Bob was the first guy that he fought when we went to Erie. <laughs> so I got a anyway. distant relative who went into, uh, he got in a bar fight years ago in the 70s. And he literally uh, got punched out. His friends had to bring him home. He lived like up over the hill of the bar. He went back two additional times and got knocked out three times in one night. Wow. So this is oh, wow. this is highly relatable to my family right here. He's, he uh, Let's just say he showed up. <laughs> so how, how long, I, I could just... Just look at hockey db but what's the fucking point man we're on the podcast and people want to hear stories so um langer so even though we're we're, inter- we're here Aaron, to interview darren colburn i want to know more anyway about no no and i love, and I love talking, that? Terry, Terry, this is a story so again you're, you're talking about darren lang and darren lang and i good friends uh he punched me in the face and punched you in the face in a game as quickly as he would well his, he has his, yeah. his cousin, his, <laughs> or as, as quickly as he would his cousin in practice so it's happened so about, anyway yeah. um Throughout that year, that was my second year in in Dayton. So I ended up getting traded from Dayton to Richmond that year. Um, so anyway, Langer, Langer, uh, for the first twenty games, he was in the top, I guess, top three in scoring on our team, and also had, I'd say, in the first twenty games, probably had over two hundred penalty minutes in the first twenty five games. Wow. Jesus Christ! I'm just looking at Langer's stat line yeah. for 92-93. 54 games played, twenty three goals, twenty two assists for forty five points, four hundred twenty nine penalty minutes. Yeah. So. so so, and a lot, of, a lot of that was my, a lot of that was my fault. So back then, <laughs> what? go ahead. But back, back then, that, that you're allowed three fights, and you're and you're gone, right? So it's not this day of day and age of ah oh, fuck yeah, I'll get one, I'm gone. No sir, you're sticking around. You fight, you're staying around for the next two. Yeah. So so, but unfortunately for Langer, every bastard that came after me the year before, every tough guy said, Langer, you got to get this guy. You got to get this guy. <laughs> but, but oh sure, yeah, that's great. Sure enough, so the the first place we went to was in Columbus, Terry, and you'll remember, you'll know this name. His name is Barry Drager. Oh god, uh, of course. Yeah, Barry. Drager, who had a long career, tough guy. Uh, anyway, Drager terrorized me because again, here I'm a goal scorer. I got to go to the front of the net with him, and yeah, he just. I know, yeah, first and, and, and I'm not a fucking fighter. Like he, he just brutalized me. I said, Langer, I this is if there's anybody I hate in this team, it's this guy. <laughs> he goes, I'm sure, I'm sure he'll come after me, Cole. I'm sure he'll come after me. Sure enough, first fucking shift comes right after him, and Langer did the same thing to him as he did to. Bob the Hammer. It was unbelievable. So I stood up on the bench and I'm banging away on the boards. And oh, um, and and again, that was taboo back then. Like now, when you see someone fighting and you got guys be- beating on the boards, that's normal. I know. So, I, I was saying to the boys before. Yeah. It, it, back then, it was fodder to get shit kicked. Oh my God! And I, I started banging because I was so happy that fucking Drager was getting the shit beat out of him. And then and then and then Ray Edwards, who was, who was a tough guy in his own right, Ray Eddie Eddie goes to me. He says, Colburn. Jesus, he said, don't do that. You're going to get fucking killed. I said, okay. I said, I'll just hold my joy inside him and fucking watch him turn on the piss out of this guy. Anyway, it was beautiful. Like I was every guy. So that every first game that we played that year against any team that had any tough guys, he fought every guy and beat every guy. I, he, I never saw him lose. Was, it was, of course, just, Barry Drager only had 301 penalty <laughs> minutes. So I know Drager came across. Came across he was a lightweight him. compared to uh, fucking Langer. And again, but again, here's here after Barry Drager, he had to fight uh, fight, fight Mark Cipriano, Rob oh. Sangster, uh, Al Novakoski. All these guys were coming after him, right? I told, I told talk, people there's there's like, yeah, but even on each team, Darren, especially in the East Coast fucking league, like there was four or five, there was at least three guys that could really go. The fourth or fifth might be able to score two. 
and they were still, but Langer was a combination of both, and that's the other reason that I often say to people, you know, they look at his NHL stat line, and a full year ago, by he had one goal and one assist, I'm like, well, he was so tough. It's not like he was out there to score, but he could score. He had a lot of points in yeah. more than one league. So, so you guys, you look at, you think, and, and I'll have a story later on about uh, uh, Brof, uh, John Brophy. In Hampton Roads, which is Norfolk now in the AHL, mm-hmm. um, in th- that year they had Aaron Downey, Moose Morissette, Bobby Babcock, Al McIsaac, and Richie Walcott. So those guys, every one of those guys were legitimate heavyweights. Yeah. And they were our close, one of our closest uh, rivals, right? So anyway, it was, it was mad. T- you know what, Aaron, back then, man? It took a lot. It, it did. It, it took a lot just to put on your gear and go out there. Once you got on the ice, for me anyway, I, I get into it. But like a lot of before the game, you know, you had to be aware. You were going out there, and there was four or five people per team that didn't give a fuck, man. Like they, you know, I chose yeah. to take the bait of more than once, but um, I mean that in the most loving way. Uh, but you know, that was hockey, and you really had to be prepared. Um, so Darren, then a couple years after this, you keep going down and ripping it up. Right, you, you, I don't know if you had a bad year in the East Coast League, so you get called up a few years later to St. John's. Your your home, well, your home is Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. Make that it's about a six seven hour drive from St. John's for those that don't know. So it's not like Darren's in St. John's and we talk to him all the time. Me and him are good buddies, and you come in here on work and we see each other. But at the time now, it's not like you were from St. John's, but you were a Newfoundlander, and enough people embraced you. And I thought you were going to be up when I heard about it for for years, and you come up for one game. Explain that. Well, again, uh, believe it or not, uh, after that Binghamton Rangers series, uh, you guys remember when St. John's lost to um, Adirondack, Adirondack yeah. that year? Mm-hmm. So Seven. just go back a little bit. That year I played in Binghamton. Binghamton actually was first overall in the AHL. We ended up losing that year, Binghamton did, to Rochester. Rochester then became the second-ranked team who got the bye. So Binghamton, if Binghamton, Binghamton had a one, I would have gone on to the finals, would have had a bye to the eight, the Calder Cup finals. Wow. We lost We lost in seven, six or seven to uh, uh, Rochester that year. So then, um, sorry, no, St. John's got the bye. So St. John's was sitting around for almost three weeks. So uh, Glenn Stanford and the boys, uh, Mark Crawford, who was coaching then, said, uh, okay, let's call every Newfoundlander we can. We need to play hockey. So myself, Slaney, uh, a whole bunch of Newfoundlanders that were playing either junior or pro, they flew us all in to St. John's. I was I was still in fucking – in the, um, on my way back from Binghamton driving with a, a U-Haul in Portland, Maine. And I got the call from Mark Crawford. This is in 91 now, 92, after finishing in Binghamton. And they flew me back from Portland. And here's my poor wife sitting there in Portland saying, well, Jesus, how am I getting home? I said, leave it here. We'll fly you home and I'll come back and get to whatever else. Right. So anyway, I flew to St. John's and uh, basically we played for two straight weeks uh, hockey against the St. John's Maple Leafs. They picked an all-star team from, from guys that were away. So now the next year, that following year, same thing happened uh, Richmond, uh, Peoria, that type of thing. Uh, I had a great year, and the coach said, "Well, I got to get you to go somewhere." So he said, "We'll get you a call up to St. John's." I went home. They called me in, and I was basically a fill-in for someone got hurt, and that—that's what that was. Wow. But again, do you um, regret was, any of it, Darren? Like, do you, do you think because? Terry, honestly, defense, defensive, the defensive side of the game. Obviously, you look at my stats uh, in in ninety three, ninety four. Now, uh, again, you score sixty nine goals and you're still fucking minus eight. Uh, that's not saying that you're you know you're you're a liability, but again. They they are looking back then saying um, here's a guy that's five eleven six foot tall uh, not a fighter uh, and is this is a totally different era like this is fucking if you're you're not fighting you're not fucking playing yeah, and that's a good point right and, uh, and again you got you got sixty nine goals thirty only thirty five assists a little bit of Cy a, Young every bit year of a Cy Young there bud yeah <laughs> no no and I you know what boys I've always always been a Cy Young because <laughs> I listened to one of your uh, one one of your shows earlier on. <laughs> And you talk with the side. Terry said, uh, "Hold a fuck." You know what that Terry said right away. You know what that means. This guy takes an awful lot of shots. Well, I led the ECHL in shots like four years in a row. I had fucking over four hundred shots. Sherry Basson, who drafted me in the uh, in the OHL with Oshawa, 
Oswald said, that fucking kid will shoot from the 401. So, <laughs> yeah. Right? But it's true, but, guys. <laughs> um, having played a bit with Darren, that's the first thing. And I'm, I'm I, you know, I, I'm more of a passer, especially when I play on the wing, which I did with Darren for all those years. Um, but Darren, I, I, I'm not, people want to know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it or I'm not going to let up. I'm not trying to blow you either, but you were, uh, I knew every time coming in off the, uh, my only job when I had the puck in my mind was to find Darren. And I'd much rather him shoot it than me. And he could be as far away from the net as possible. Darren, even far away from the net would, as possible would be you on your one-timer side out by the blue line. That would be as far away. You could, I used to take it in the wing and look for him coming across. Fire it, guys. Like, just throw it his direction. Yeah. And it was a one-timer. And just a, I'm not saying it went in every and, time, but if it's coming at you 100 miles an hour. And that's what I'm actually curious about. Because looking at looking at your hockey DB, and I don't I know not hockey DB is not always like the most fucking accurate thing. It's fairly. Because I love fairly hockey accurate. DB. They're missing an entire season of uh, Canadian yeah. hockey here. I'll make some calls. Um, but it says here that you're a left shot that usually plays a right wing. That's right. That's, so, and, uh, that's how that, that when I went to Cornwall, Orville Tessier, another fucking legend. Uh, he was my coach in Cornwall. He said, um, I, I've already got a left winger. He's the best left winger on the, in, in the OHL. His name was Steve Maltese. I yeah. need someone to play. I need someone to stay and play on his right side. And he said, uh, you're going to be it unless you can learn to shoot right. He said, you're playing right wing. Boom. And so, so did, you, did you find that that opened you up for one timers more? Well, that's all I did. I was, it was footwork. Uh, honestly, Mike, it was footwork. Once you get the footwork down, and, and it's amazing to me how, how many guys cannot do it. And I look at the NHL these days, like you look at Ovechkin. You it's look his at bread and butter, right? He's, yeah, just, that's, he's, just, he's just doing shit. those off-wing off it's, uh, it's, it's, one-timers. To them, to them it's, it's easy. But you look at most guys that try and do that, it's almost like they're fucking doing a dance that they've never done before. You know what? Yeah. Jay anyway. Pominville uh, blocked his own shot trying at the uh, – he was on his offside. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, blocked his, he blocked his own shot last the other night. night. I think it was, yeah. Was yeah. He, uh, he blocked his own – he fanned on it, and he ended up blocking his own shot coming through on it. I yeah. know because I, I, in, my, in my beer league that uh, I play, <laughs> I generally play on the left wing even though I'm a right shot, and it's very similar. Like, I got the footwork down, but I can't pick up a pass or shoot. So well, it kind of takes me out of the game. The other Boy, side, Darren. So. Well, I, I, yeah, no, good point. And <laughs> good point. No, and again, no, it's just, oh, don't worry about I'm, it, Mike. I'm, it's fine. No, it's a good point, man. That's, that's true about you. But what I was but again, say, it's but, in your uh, Mike. You you get it. Get it in your sweet spot, man. That's all you can say. Is get I love it, how we get just it, compared his beer league to uh, oh, yeah, a sixty, like an all an to ECHL. I'll do it. I'll do it. It's I had to find a common ground. It relates, but guys, that's what I mean. I often say like because there's two different ways to take a one timer. Well, there's lots of different ways, but on the power play, you'll see the stationary guy standing there and that's way harder than it looks yep. um, but Darren I thought it was strategic I didn't realize that you got put over there which made sense it ended up being strategic but what I'm talking about picture me on the left wing coming in mm-hmm. Darren's all the way over on the other side of the ice so not I wasn't always passing it like laterally to him I was going like further into the corner and coming back mm-hmm. now he's sk- he's got a 100 mile an hour shot anyway close to now he's skating into this pass which is even scarier and he's got more to shoot at because mm-hmm. if, Dar- if Darren comes from the far wing by the time I give it's it to him, he's the in the middle. Yeah, you see him way more. He's in the middle, yeah. If the other way, sorry, sorry, the other yeah. way, you're kind of hoping that the, you hit the, the goalie off guard and he's out of the net. And you mm. give it to him and you slap it fast enough. But the first way, Darren is just taking a, a cannon and the goalie can't see it. Anyway, mm. sorry to cut you off. Were you oh, no, say? it's fine. I was just going to say this sounds exactly like my game and just how I play. So <laughs> it was fine. I mean, it, I didn't. <laughs> Again, the boys, you know what? It was it was with me. It wasn't about, yes, I was accurate. But that comes with practice. But I just got rid of the puck. I got it. And I shot it. it was fast. And yeah. a lot of times I just didn't, I didn't look. It was like a no look. And then the other one that used to drive guys nuts was I used to get the puck and I used to shoot and I'd shoot off. So I, rather than shoot where I looked at where I was shooting, I'd take that little, almost like a, no, I don't know, it was like a, a fake and then just push it back towards where the goalie was coming from. And I don't think the thing would be going 30 or 40 miles an hour, but the guy would end up in the corner and the puck would go on the net and you're like, holy fuck. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, and the other thing you're in. Stinks, right? Like th- things often, Darren, that that you um, take for granted. But like you would get it looking down. You weren't looking at the net, but you knew where the top corner was, and you knew that the odds were if it's in front of the net, high glove. I, I, if I shoot it there, they're the most open space. So the law of averages says mm-hmm. by the end of the year, a guy that knows that. Um, I used to look at Stepan Richet in front of the net, and he used to line up about thirty pucks across the hash or the or the front of the crease. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and he just used to go from one side to the other, like quick, like like a lot of people take one timer slap shots. Yeah, he would do that and just flip it, flip it, flip it. He's like, you mark of a goal scorer, tr mark of a goal scorer, top corner baby. Because if it's ever free in front, yeah. how many times do you see some guy come in fourth liner and whack at it, and <laughs> yeah. you're just like, you know, just put it up in the air. The goalie's sprawling across. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of this is coming from Darren's mouth. Uh, he, he t- I don't want again, to say Tommy, again, but I, a guy that I never ever played with, he did play in Cornwall, but he was there when I was in Oshawa. Uh, was Ray Shepard? Ray Shepard yeah. uh, was, was the most deceptive, probably one of the worst skaters I've ever seen. But you put him below below the tops of the circles, the man was magician. Like it, and when like you. You don't know hands until you stand there and watch a guy who can stick handle, standing still, and still beat four guys at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then fucking roof it under the bar from five feet out. It's like, oh. It was, and I'm sitting on the bench in Oshawa watching this and then had to go out and fucking fight someone. I'm like, holy fuck. I don't want to be a bottom six player. So I said, I better start shooting a lot more pucks. Shooting yeah. and fighting. <laughs> and, and, and the year you're talking about, uh, in 85, 86 with, uh, with Cornwall, Ray Shepard well, led, led the team. 81. Okay, because in 85-86, Shepard led Cornwall with uh, 81 goals. Right. So I was I was the rookie 85-86. So can I tell a little story about my first game in the OHL? Oh, of course, absolutely. absolutely. Happily. This is the whole point. So, <laughs> and, there's kind, and there's kind of a, a little bit of irony at the end of this because it's our first game going up to Cornwall. This was the team that I ended up getting all my accolades with. And so I'm, I'm a rookie with the Oshawa Generals. I'm on the fourth line. I'm wearing the long Cooper Balls, all in red. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So a fucking wet neck right off the bus, uh, wearing the 501 Dow blue blades right from fucking Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. All right. So I get out my second shift, get out there, and I'm lucky enough to get an assist on the first goal. So I'm skating around the back of the net with my hands in the air, but who should I fucking run into? Old Razor, old Robbie Ray, who is the same age as me, but Fuck. Had, but but Razor had 350 fucking penalty minutes in Whitby Junior B the year before, and I had uh, probably 50 in the uh, <laughs> midget fucking A in, in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. So Razor's after fighting 50 times in his career already. I haven't had one. So Jeez. anyway, and and he is, loves to fight. <laughs> uh, this is it. So imagine this is his his first OHL game and mine. So what do you think he wants to do? He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't care if he runs into fucking Max Middendorf or fucking anybody. He's going to fight or bird dog. So he he says, it's a, I'll never forget it. He looks at me and says, let's fucking go, Wayne. And I said, oh. <laughs> I said Wayne Gretzky's blue blades. I'm like, fuck you. Anyway. <laughs> no way. Well, That's let's a compliment, go. though. That's a compliment. <laughs> it's a beauty. No, no. But the blue blades he was making fun of. So he says, let's go, Wayne. Did you so opt for the blue blades and other people didn't no, have them? Or did everybody no, have to wear no. them? These, these were my midget skates from the year before. Oh, we, oh, I thought you meant your old fucking right? team wore them. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, These that's the way to bring attention to yourself on the ice just, right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. the Cooper Alls, though, right? A little wet. Everybody had to wear the Cooper Alls. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. I was, was going to have a lot of questions. Guy, and, as long as you put the only guy there, yeah. And the XL7s. Those were real beauties, too. Wait, do you know those helmets? Please yeah. Google the fuck. Oh, you know what the yeah, XL7s are. Yeah, the Cooper right? ones, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's calling it a helmet How is did you not get made fun of? <laughs> oh, man. The fans just come to the rink and just make fun of everybody. You're going around in XL7s, fucking yeah. blue blades, and Cooper Alls. <laughs> well, well, the only thing that could make that worse is if your jerseys are pink. Yeah, no, not not quite yet. But anyway, here's that's part of the story. So I fight, I start fighting Razor, we're going really great for 20 seconds, and then I fuck, I tripped on the fucking stick, I fall flat flat on my face. So him being all amped up, he jumps on top and just starts fucking wailing away at the back of my head. Oh yeah. So I can feel every punch. I said, "Where's the fucking linesman?" Like anyway, there was a fight in front of the net. All I can remember is looking in our net. And I'm looking up, and all I can remember is Jim Pack, uh, the guy who played in Pittsburgh. Jimmy he was one Pack. Of Jimmy Pack had Robbie in the fucking net. He hauled him off, pulled him in the net, and started doing the same thing to him that I, he was doing to me. So, <laughs> this sounds like slap shot. Yeah, this. Oh, this, it, uh, no, man, it was it was wicked. Federal league. <laughs> This is this is this is OHL in 1985, 86, and every game we played against Oshawa and Peterborough. There was a brawl before every game, and the funny thing about the brawls between Oshawa and Peterborough before the game, nobody got any penalties. It was fucking Ty Domi, Chris oh, Kane. Oh. 
Ty Domi, Chris King, Terry Karkner thought would fight our tough guys, who would be Johnny Stevens, Jimmy Pack, uh, Jimmy Bowalda, guys like that. And they just go off after warm up and come back out on the ice and play the game. So, like, uh, was, no, no, was, yeah. It was crazy. Like I, I just, and here I am. Like I said, right out of Newfoundland. I'm saying, Steve Dunn told me before I left. Uh, your father's uh, coach, Steve Dunn, he played a couple of years in Verdun, and that he said, uh, "Are you going to get your bone taken into your nose?" I said, "Fuck off, Dunny. I'm not going to. No, this, that's not that bad." He goes, "Oh yes, it is." And, <laughs> Man. and oh yes, it was. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and for, just to give people a point of reference there. Rob Ray, again, I got him. Anybody my age will know, but mm. if you don't know who Rob Ray is, so he's he's a real tough guy. Played on Buffalo for a long time, maybe even a couple other teams. I remember him with just, Buffalo, just Ottawa, I think. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, at the very end. But um, you know, and they came up with the Rob Ray rule. That's why no one can fight anymore and come out of their jersey because Rob Ray used to come out of his jersey, and then you had nothing to grab onto but sweaty skin, which is not easy to hang on to. And he would shit kick whoever came his way. He would he would anyway. This guy was a killer. I mean, look at his picture. You can tell that um, that he liked to fight. But um, and Jimmy Peck was one of the first, if not the first Asian. Can I say Asian? Is that, is that yes. okay? Yes, it was Korean. Korean. Yeah, Korean. Okay. I just don't even know what to say anymore. Orient. Or, or Asian, no, Asian or Asian. Asian. Asian's the one, not okay. Oriental. Stanley Cup champion, Jim Peck. Because they still say like Oriental stir fry and stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm really not trying to be racist when I say that word. I, I thought mean, it meant from that part of the world. Uh, in any case, Jim Peck was a legendary innovator because he was one of the first. So I'm sure that all kinds of Asian kids looked up to him. And that's why we have not a whole lot today, but we definitely have a few more. Um, right after that was Paul Korea and family. But uh you know, I just wanted to let people know that because those are two big names, right? And, and a lot of names that Darren's dropping here. Even Steve Maltese was a big minor league scorer. I remember well, that. Well, again, like, like I said, uh, after that, you play two years against the guy. And, and the way it was, uh, the coach, the GM, telling you, okay, you got to go fight him again. You got to fight him again. You can't let him do that. So two years later, um, I, again, you look at my, my uh, hockey DB thing in Oshawa. I played sparingly in my second year. I, had, I asked for a trade because these guys were, were loading up for the Memorial Cup. I wasn't ready. I needed to play. Yeah. So it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I, I went to Sherry Bass and I said, uh, Sherry, I'm sorry, man. I, I need a trade because I, I'm not going to play on this team. I'm not ready to play on this team. Um, I've got uh, another year or so to get ready uh, if I do want to get drafted. Uh, at that point, uh, 14 of the 18 guys on our team were already drafted. So, again, so this team here, so that Oshawa Generals team that you saw in 86-87, they lost two years in a row in the Memorial Cup final to um, uh, Medicine Hat Tigers. Two years in a row they lost to Medicine Hat. And it was incredible how good those teams were like all Medicine future, Hat with they, Trevor Linden I believe oh Trevor oh, wow. Linden I like the name the Rob DeMaio uh, Fitzpatrick uh, Mark Pedersen um, they, DeMaio <laughs> Chinouth, all these guys they're all they're all NHL players right oh and, yeah for sure um, oh go ahead Chuck, I mean. so take take it back a, a quick minute there Darren um so you said you, you went in and, and you, you had asked for a trade. I just got a quick question for you. It seemed like, did you have an agent at this point in time? Like, I know this is a complete different league. It's We're going question. back. But, but I mean, it, it seems like you had to make an awful lot of hard decisions on your own uh, yeah. if you didn't have an agent. And and I'm just wondering, like, yeah, all of these, you, you talk about year-end meetings with uh, people offering you contracts and stuff like that. Like, all of this stuff is vetted away yeah. from players now, so they just play. How much of a difference do you think that makes uh, as, as an 18-year-old kid or you you would have been younger then you were trying to get drafted is saying yeah. you know what you you got and and this is like you've got to move you got to relocate you're already away from home i was two years two years before my 18th birthday and i had to walk in the office of the general manager in oshawa and ask for a trade uh again you, like we talked about the matthew snyders and the owen nolans mm -hmm. and all these guys these guys are bona fide first rounders second rounders that type of thing mm -hmm. they have they have agents lining up to be at their yeah you know, like Pat Brisson found these guys when they were like 15 <laughs> right so Terry yeah. Terry Ryan goes away and, and again Terry I'm not uh, this is this is your life you went away because you had to you weren't going to get any better where you were so yeah. you left you left as a band player to go play junior which is to me is fucking crazy because yeah. I know how tough those leagues were back then and I know what you had to do in order to become that type of player and and that was what I needed. I, I needed to get out of here, but I had to get out of here before I was 16. I never got out of here until I was 16, 17. 
Yeah, so, I know what you, mean. Uh, you You have to be subjected to that type of hockey. And the generals were trying to make me a, a bottom six player. And I knew that, listen, boys, if I got to rely on fucking my fists and being tough, it's just as well for me to go home now. Because I, I will fight. I'll fight anybody. But you know what? I just proved against Rob Bray that I can't fight that guy 10 times a year. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's funny, guys? Um, when I left to go to Cornell, I was 14. So I was first year Bantam. And the word, well, I ended up ma- making the junior team. And, well, making, I think they had me penciled in. Because Tri-Cities kind of set it up. They wanted to draft me there. And I'd go there when I was 16. So my two Bantam years, I played junior. That's what Dar- Darren's referring to. But you know what's funny? I ended up leading my team in scoring both years. But way before that, eight games in, I remember I had no goals, one assist. I was really down on myself, uh, similar to my NHL stat line. And, um, but I was thinking, you know, this is, I, I got to make a move here. And I was down, and Wayne Gretzky's agent, Mike Barnett, showed up in Cornell and asked me. Uh, all I was doing was playing as a 14-year-old. That was before anything else happened. Of course, he was pumped when I started scoring, but... That's how Darren, to go back to what you said, Chuck, yeah. and Darren saying about leaving. Not only does leaving make you a better player, but leaving, at, especially then, puts you on the map. Mm. People, a, a lot of these kids, like now, everybody, you, you know, it's hard to hide, and it's a good thing. Uh, Michael Ryder was the last of, you know, you Bonavista, and he kind of had to get lucky. Since then, uh, I mean, he was going to make him, that's saying Rides is lucky. But since then, it's really tough to miss a prospect now, no matter where they're yeah. playing, the international well, appeal of, or the, 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 the uh, globalization, I guess, of the mm. internet. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, for me to move was not outlandish. It was hard on me and everything. But once I got there, I became immersed in this world. And I'm doing well. I I played on Team Pacific, you know, uh, as a 15, 16-year-old, whatever it is, under-17 tournament. And, you know, I knocked somebody out, like someone good. So I don't mean like with my fists. I mean, like I, I took a spot from them. So oh, I was okay. up there. So, oh, you know, I'm okay. that age. So I just jump into this. So there's scouts that have been scouting these kids. It's a bit of a bore. Everybody knew Wade yeah. Redden was the best player, you know, since he was 12. Everybody knew Jerome McGinley was pretty good, right? But I'm out there going, who the fuck is this guy from yeah. Mount Pearl? My only tournament that I'd gone to was the Quebec Pee Wee tournament that would have been yeah. any international. And Darren is back there in Cornerbrook, even more isolated at the time, mm-hmm. hockey-wise. Knowing that, you know, he's got this, I mean, he had confidence, we got this shot, got this player inside of him. I mean, we all know that, is, that we, we want to do our best, but he just didn't have the tools. He didn't go away early enough, and he certainly wasn't, you know, I, I'd liken it to your situation on a relative level, Martin St. Louis. I played against Martin in, in, um, in uh, the, the AHL, and he was pretty good. He had 65, 70 points. You wouldn't think he would be a Hall of Famer, but he was good. But he wasn't playing as much as he should have. Calgary brings him up and puts him on the fourth line. What the fuck do you do with Martin St. Louis on the fourth, fourth line, line? But give him a chance <laughs> to spread his wings. Yeah. And in my level, on, on, a, on a, in my mind, on a relative level, um, Darren Colburn's that guy. Just uh, you know that sh- should have been given a better opportunity. But you know, at least Darren, at least it came. You could have gotten injured, or you could have not gone in for that trade, and you become a guy who played in the OHL for four years. Pretty good when you were nineteen, twenty. You might have gotten fifty points. But you know, we're talking you know, now as a uh, ring holding ECHL Hall of Fame legend. So that brings us to our next question. Good segue. Yeah. yeah, nice segue there, hey. Roller <laughs> hockey. My first game. Oh, boys, yes. the segue? My first camp. No, because there's absolutely no connection. That's why I, I, I was joking. <laughs> no, I'm on board here. My first camp, I've talked a lot, but it, it, this warrants it. My first camp is in Montreal. It's at the Montreal Forum, the last year of the Forum. I go there. What's happening? So I'm staying at the Man- Manor Le Moyne or the Manoir Le Moyne, um, next to the Forum. So I go down, and I'm really nervous. The next day, I got to go meet Patrick Waugh, and they drafted me just a couple months before. I'm staying in the hotel, and I haven't been on the ice or anything yet. I haven't even met one Montreal Canadian. I'm kind of nervous. What am I going to do to kill the time? They were advertising at the Forum as an actual roller hockey game, and it's the finals. And it's San Jose versus Montreal. So I'm like, let's the road, go. The Road Runners. The Road, yes, yeah, San Jose Rhinos versus the Montreal Road Runners. And Yvonne Cornway is coaching the Road Runners. And he was assistant coach of the Habs. So mm-hmm. I was like, at least he ended up being. But anyway, I was intrigued because it's, it's Yvonne Cornway. And my buddy Darren Colburn's playing. And we didn't even really know each other that well then. I knew you from baseball. But I get pretty decent seats. Boys, it's fucking sold out. Nice. This was a, It's four on four. There's no hitting. So, A, no wonder Darren ended up being a super duper star, <laughs> arguably the best player of all to come through there. Um, but, A, Darren, how did that happen with roller hockey? And as you're telling your story, tell them about winning the world championship in Anaheim, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay. But I think, but Terry, uh, just, just to get back to that Montreal story, um, again, well, let me start out with. What, 
the coach Roy Summer. He coached us in Richmond, and Roy is from the the Bay Area, and he uh, they ended up winning a championship uh, in Richmond uh, the year before. Uh, I was gone, and uh, anyway, he said, "Let's get let's get all my best players. Let's bring them over to San Jose to play in the, we call it the Derby. So we're going to play in the Derby for what for a that gift. Year. What did you feel when you got what, you know what I mean? Oh, did you even my. know about yeah. this?" And had no idea. So here we are going up the devil's pulpit, going up in San Francisco, and this is how we learned to rollerblade. So he had us, our initiation was he had to bring our rollerblades up to the top of the hill, and he had to rollerblade down the devil's pulpit. That's that big Jesus hill right on the, the waterfront there. So Where, in San up, Fran? In San Fran. Oh, if you I end know up the living, hill you mean. Yes. Yeah, if you end up living through that, you made the team. So we basically <laughs> had this. Right? So, so Did you anyway, lose anyone? <laughs> We, no, we didn't. Actually, it was pretty good. But the, the problem was in, in California, when you're practicing, it's got to be kind of a, a, a you know, a, a country club setup because you can't pre- – we, we didn't even practice inside that year because it was too expensive. We played out of the shark tank. So, <laughs> wow. We, yeah, so we couldn't practice inside. So we, we practiced on an outdoor rink, but we had to practice before 10 in the morning because it was fucking 99 degrees at fucking 11. So it was like get, get practice over with. We practice on some asphalt court or whatever. But, again, when you're on a good team, it doesn't matter. It's guys play and they're good and that type of thing. So a good friend of uh, – um, a series in mine is uh, Mark Wolf. Wolfie was in the top three players in the league. He was a yeah. great player, and God bless him. Everything that he ever did, he always took me along for. So I was now. Don't get me wrong; I could score, but he, Wolfie did everything. He was, uh, you know, uh, captain. He was uh, on for penalty kill, power play, regular shift, that type of thing. And is, um, is it Wolfie it, that got you over to Scotland too? It was, yes. Yeah, because I saw you guys are both on the same team there. Wolfie's too. a good friend yeah. of mine, too, guys. I ended up going to the Memorial Cup or the Allen Cup final with Allen Wolfie. Cup, yeah. And he oh, played yeah. with us in Cornerbrook. Okay. Oh, so just, yeah. Darren, you, you're you doing you're doing a great job telling your own story. Keep going, it's son. A, but it's I'm a saying fish, it's, Wolfie came it's, it's over a at wonderful. the end. Yeah, he's our buddy. Go ahead. It's a wonderful circle of friends, basically. And, and you know what? When, when you win and you bring guys who win in, that's why you win more. And that's basically what happened. But that, great, that story about meeting Thierry at the Montreal Forum, um, basically that was the we, – we walked in there with a the lead. We ended up losing. And the way the series went, this is roller hockey, we lost the first game of the, um, the best of three. And it was tied, so it went to what's called a mini game. We won the mini game in an extra three, extra two minutes on an on an overtime goal to give us the championship, and wow. I can remember shit hit me. I can remember rubber chickens hitting me in the head from fucking people throwing stuff. Well, it was but packed I, though. Like Darren, it was, it was what full. were the fans like in California? Like, did you guys? Hey, so at the beginning of the year, there's some guys on your team that like played a few games in the East Coast League that are gliding down a hill for dear life, and yeah. at the end of the year, which was really only two or three months in roller hockey, they're playing to a sold out Montreal Forum. What yeah. the fuck? Yeah, exactly. And you know what's great about that year? That was the last championship ever won at the Montreal Forum because it was closed oh in my God. Right? Oh. See, right? I told you, boys, this That's was a legendary. Mic drop. Holy yeah. It is. And we might not have even gotten there. No. That's wild. That Darren's got a lot of stories. Holy. So in those in those ring in those rings, the, one of those rings they gave us, uh, it says last championship ever won at the Montreal. No, not in that many words. Last championship won Montreal Forum. And that's going to fuck up a lot of bar trivia groups with that question. Yeah. Oh, over now. Right? Yeah. 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 And it was, boys, it, this was total legit. A lot of times, it's like ball hockey. When I say ball hockey, people think I'm running around on the street. A lot of times you say roller hockey, they picture your, because there was also a pro roller derby league. Yeah. And that was the, the one beach. with the, that was like the ramps yeah. behind the net. Ramps. Yeah. So yeah. That's and, a, no, yeah. this we was real the hockey. Ron Duge, the Ron Duguay league, we used to call that one. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it all yeah. took off at the same time. And guys, it re- I'd like to know, I don't know if you know, but I don't know why it ever folded. I mean, there was it, it got to the point, guys, it was like so an East point. Division and a West Division. I remember going to a game on a layover in Minneapolis. Minneapolis, 12, 13,000 people in the middle of the summer. It, it peaked at 93, 94. Uh, the RHI peaked at 24 teams. By 98, 99, it was down to eight. Wow. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then this, the year after that, the... Um, the year after, I'm just looking at the Anaheim Bullfrogs playing yes. in the uh, terrible team, the name, Major by the League way. Roller Hockey League, which was uh, yeah. it only lasted for one year, and that was 14 teams. So I think what happened is that it looks like a couple Still of teams, 
It looks like the couple, a couple of the teams were, were kind of in both, and they and they split, and then they both just folded. Now, be, before I get no, that's it's great work, Mike. Now you're you're really you, you're, Mike, you're picking up your fucking game on the research. That's as awesome. we go. So I'm trying. I'm trying um, here, guys. But so, Mike. So here's here's the story between Anaheim and San Jose. Anaheim and San Jose were were the bitter, bitterest rivals in the in the RHI. So it was owned by a guy named Stuart Silver, who um, basically Anaheim was the rich team san jose had a good team but they this stuart silver they played out of the duck pond or or, our arrowhead pond or whatever we played we played in all the nhl buildings it was unbelievable Mm -hmm. uh we were treated like kings um and then you know sport court and all that kind of stuff but anyway um the year we beat year we won the world championship with san jose we beat Anaheim in the final and they were they were touted to, to beat everyone like they were unbelievable anyway I scored the goal in overtime to put us into the finals against Montreal and I can remember that the finals that year was the same thing but it wasn't a mini game it was do right to the end and it was the best feeling i've ever like again it's only fucking roller hockey but when you score an ot winner to put your team into the finals i I went back to the bench and i'm like i'm standing at arrowhead pond and i'm looking up at the scoreboard going you gotta be kidding me and there was like there was like twelve thousand people there and they were all fucking brewing us and that was yeah it was incredible sorry sorry i didn't mean to cut that off i just wanted to have you elaborate on the because guys there was that and then from that okay I'll preface this this way. Our buddy, I just talked about Mark Wolf. Yep. 2004, he felt that he's not kidding. To expand on that and, and to go roller hockey, and then I'm coming back, Darren. He calls yep. me up. Now, we played local roller hockey here. Mark Wolf calls me and says, Cheese can't wait to call Darren Cheese. Cheese can't come. A couple more guys couldn't come that you had played with. And do you want to come and play in a world championship? And I go, I went to the world's. It was in London, Ontario that year. We lost to USA in the final. But just that's what, that's how good these guys, and they were real good. I mean, I, I knew how to rollerblade, but I hadn't played at a high level. Mm. I, I could fit in, I guess, and, and but Wolfie could have easily taken somebody else. He could justify getting me there, you know, an NHL guy not far removed. Um, you know, we'll, we'll teach him while he's here kind of thing. But I, I'd already known how to rollerblade, but that's what kind of guy he is. So that was that world championship. As I'm at it, the boys are telling me, hey, a few years ago, Cheese won, and they played in Anaheim, and I look at the, you can still get it on YouTube somewhere, I don't know what the search engine is, or search is, but Darren, didn't you guys win it in Anaheim with like a real lot of people, or wasn't it like sold out or something like that? Well, it was kind of that year. It was team. It was Team Canada, and guys, Team Canada does things real special. So whether you're playing with the women's team, the junior team, the the, the NHL guys, before every game, and it kind of gives you shivers. I don't know if they still did this, Terry, when you were there, but they the jersey. You don't put your jersey on. The jersey is a ceremony every game. So when you put on a Team Canada jersey, they turn on Tina Turner, simply the best. <laughs> and they, they and did. they go around. They go around the room, and you put your jersey on one at a time, because that's what they. That's how they prop it up. As fucking yeah. rule. Yeah, they still. Did that, you, they still did that when I was there, and I, yeah. I, I took and did a variation of that for Team yeah. Canada ball hockey. I mean, everything yeah. is passed on, right? I learned that in two thousand and four, and yeah. we do a not quite the same. I won't get into it, but the same sort of thing. And that's I mean, how, how good is that to feel? I mean, Darren, your world championship and you got your ring. I'm going to post it after and show people, but I mean, what an experience. I don't give a fuck what you win and don't downplay it. Like you, you are one of the best bo- uh, roller hockey players on the planet. And, um, you know, a lot of people played, I mean, I don't want to get back to like, what was it like to win? But what was it fucking like to win? <laughs> well, again, it's like, I was, I was brought in like, and, and if it wasn't for Wolfie, I probably would have played uh but we were a good combo in san jose and we we scored a lot of goals and actually that year in 98 he and i and this is what's kind of gross about this anaheim bullfrogs team in 98 we took the best players from the rhi basically and threw them all in anaheim and we just ran we just raped everybody in the league like it was gross like you look at my i, I was a plus 66 and there's no fucking way that's going to happen any time <laughs> hey the loading, different, this is a different game though darren it's four on four yeah. no hitting yeah you were made anyway it was it was unbelievable to win like and you're talking an international event um it just you know like you said whether it's fucking uh, marbles or or hockey or baseball you win and you you battle for it and you go through a full tournament and that's that's what it's about and teaching kids today about is not what 
it's not what's at the end it's how you get there that's the best part of all this and the shit that you go through uh, that's such a hard lesson to teach as, as as a coach as a an old guy to say boys don't think about what's going to happen in four games worry about now and that's that's the hardest thing to teach kids even yeah. older guys that never ever thought of it that way the fun part is what's in between it's not fucking what's at the end okay um no you're right tc and um I've got a, you know, we're running short on time. I can't believe it. It seems like we've gone four and five minutes no worries, an hour. Um, but I do want to, so a couple of little things at least. Um, I should let everybody kind of know here. D- Darren is a great, one of the best two sport athletes ever from Newfoundland and Labrador. And I'll tell you why. He's a, is hockey's one thing, but baseball. So we're not known for baseball, but. Uh, you know, I grew up with it. My dad won the batting in here. Uh, there's a St. John's League and there's, a, you know, a, gr- a great for Canada rivalry. Uh, there's a, uh, It goes across the island. They have playdowns every year. It usually ends up to be Cornerbrook Barons, where, where Darren's from and plays for. Uh, did play for. It. And uh, against the St. John's Caps. I, I, had, I, I played for the Mount Pro Blazers. We never really had a dog in the race. Maybe one or two years. Uh, we were pretty inferior, but... My dad, growing up, I used to go to all the games. Dad won seven batting championships. He's one of the best. Wow. Bat- and dad was picked for Team Canada when he was 15. So he had to make a decision. Um, and, you know, realistically, though, Newfoundland, there was no, he knew. I'm not, I'm not saying dad would have played in the major leagues. He's doing all that. But he went to the national competition and hit. Now, Darren Colburn is in the same boat. Both could make an argument. If you were to talk to people around here, I think a lot of the great players would say that they're both in the top 10, you know, at the, at the very least. So, Darren... Growing up, my question, and, you know, again, we're talking to a superb ball player here. Did you keep playing during all that dedication to hot, like during Oshawa and Cornwall and you're going through all that? My dad took a few years off. Did, did you keep playing? And what did you think the goal ever was? I mean, you were knocking them out. You were one of the best ball players growing up the whole way, the best for many, many years in your late teens. Did you ever think that would have been an option? That was actually the option right out of my uh, – the year I got drafted in the OHL, I had to make a decision, and within three to four weeks, I had an opportunity to go to Virginia to play baseball at a, at a uh, high school level. And um, I just it, – it, I chalked it up as I play hockey six months a year. I play baseball two to three. Um, you know, people said, oh, geez, I thought you were a better baseball player. Two totally different sports. Um, totally. Ideally, yeah. ideally, if I could have done it, I would have loved to have gone to a, a university like Michigan or something like that. We could do both, or you know. But, well, you, you know, know what? In this day and age, you probably could. Yeah, you know what I mean. You could send in a know. video. I don't know that you can, though. I don't know that in this day and age, yeah. like you don't see the same kind of two sport athletes because you're seeing places where like the competition has gotten so intense. For you know, you got 32. Well, Chris Sparks did it a few like, on, a, on a much minor level. No, sorry, I cut you off. Keep going. No, I was just going to say that I, I up, even up until recently, it was something that was common for there to be two sport athletes. I mean, fucking Tom Brady was drafted by the Montreal Expos for fuck's sakes. Yeah, um, I did not know that he was a catcher. He was a catcher in the Expos organization. Um, and so, like a two sport athlete, up until even like. 10 ish years ago was a much more common thing but now it seems like analytics the way they are it's just there's been so much pressure put on anybody trying to break out and get and get there that i just don't think a two sport athlete's an option anymore well, they're looking for more dedication like any any true league enough, is I, looking for i was i was coming from the dedication. point of view of could you get Notice for both, like you, you know, if I, think I if, you could get noticed, I didn't notice yeah, for both. You'd, well, if you were going, but like, they're going to make you boys, make your it, choice. It does yeah. happen, though. It does happen. Yeah. Like Chris Sparks, for example, I think it was Div Three, but he went down and got a scholarship to uh, Southern Maine. But, you know, when the when the baseball season came, mm-hmm. he's like, I'm I'm not here for that. Can I try out? This was not that long ago, yeah. and he and he went and um, well, he's made about it. my age, yeah, I think yeah. So I, I I just think it'd give you an option to fo- you only hear about the guys like Tom Glavin went the third round didn't he yeah. to the LA Kings Something the base- like baseball player oh, yeah, but yeah. that ends up being a story because Tom Glavin became a superstar Tom Brady became a superstar so it, it's a story but it does happen I, I don't know how much but I've been down to the states I've heard like guys on two rides and so if Darren, all I'm saying is that if Darren Colburn the baseball player had landed with a memorial or with a scholarship in hockey to Miami, Ohio or one of these places then he probably could have you know, scrapped hockey altogether. I know what you're saying, the analytics part, oh, yeah, yeah, no. but he's down there as a two-sport athlete with with a scholarship. 
Um, I, and I think it, I think that goes more to a good good argument, though, good debate. No, I, I and I just think it's 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 more of a case now. I think I now say, it yeah. goes more to that the kid themselves are a one sport athlete. Yeah, because think, people don't grow up. My dad fucking force me like I, those skates are off now you're not now it's not like I couldn't go out back and shoot at the net but he was like you know you're not stressing yourself out by the time you're 16 you're going to want to quit I'm telling you and he forced me to play baseball or, or soccer or whatever the fuck it might be with something else now not so much at least if I'm going by the kids I'm coaching I go to the rink and mo- the 90% of the kids like their dads or their moms will say okay as soon as the season's over you do hockey's clinics it's all good I'll coach them mm-hmm. but I recommend them do something else but not let as many kids do do other things uh, it, just like the whole baseball soccer argument we grew up my, t- my Mount Pearl team oh, you play baseball what there's a soccer team can we play and we won the Atlantics we all played everything right but now if you look at even in Mount Pearl say where I grew up baseball's on the same day as soccer mm-hmm. they used to just schedule it differently yeah. so we'd all be able to play but I think you know I'm, el- I'm elaborating a lot but that's what I think I, I-, I think that the opportunities maybe are there but for you to be you know the analytics make it possible for these scouts to just look for one thing and you end up riding one sport way more than the other but I also one, think uh, so, sorry Jack and, and Darren's still on the phone with us it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's also I just think that it's, it's a case where you also got to think now where there's ice down like way more frequently to have year way round. more rinks have ice down all year round and so there's hockey clinics and camps and tryouts and practices going all through the year and so that what I'm saying is like for someone to like want to be interested in baseball and that is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying that. Yeah, it's just that thing where it's like it used to be like in my hometown, like the ice just came up in fucking May or whatever. Like after the Easter tournament, uh, that was it. The ice was gone. You didn't have the option to keep playing. Um, and you know, you, you switched then to ball hockey, and then Jeremy Bishop became the best fucking ball hockey player in the history of well, the fucking country. There, there's, <laughs> there's, um, something maybe to look at. I, I think there are still people that do it. But, but they, it's still rare. It was rare yeah. then. It was rare then, but I mean, I think it's rarer now as well. There's a book out, boys. It's called, uh, the, it came out four or five years ago and I read it. It's called Selling the Dream. And it's all about what TR just kind of said. Uh, is that parents more or less you said you're gonna when the season's up, you're going to clinics, you're going to this, you're going to that. And they kind of use horror stories of athletes that hurt themselves double dipping in sport kind of foggily knowing not knowing what you're at as much as you are to stick to one sport and one of the horror stories that they kind of uh, pedal on them is Don Cherry Don Cherry's hockey career more or less was compromised by a softball injury Uh, the Bruins told him don't play softball don't play softball don't play softball Don Cherry said well how am I going to stay in shape Mm. and he uh, did some serious damage I believe to either an elbow or a shoulder TVs were black and white in that era too (laughs) right do as VCRs, VCRs yeah. True, were 30 years in the future. Is, yeah. I know, I, I know what you guys are saying. Yeah. I just think there are people. I just the famous ones you know about, but we don't have any idea. Do we? NCAA now? How do you know how many athletes are playing two sports? Oh, yeah. I don't. You don't. There could be some swimmers that row. You know what I mean? We're, we're really isolating yeah, our yeah, argument yeah, yeah. here. Of, we have no sure. idea what we're talking about, and we're talking about two sports that of like but 50. Also, if a lot we of football players. players we don't know what I'm talking about. We would not yeah. have this. Yo, sir, you know <laughs> this podcast that, if we didn't want to talk about things we didn't know. And Darren's here on the phone. Sorry, Darren, about that. And, yeah. no, that's all right, boys. Boys, when it comes down to it, it's it's money invested. It's money invested in people. That's why you don't see a whole lot of that's, it. And yeah, that's what. Yeah, I thought. there you that's go. What that's what, well. yeah. The guest just had a good point. He hasn't spoken in ten minutes. Darren, do you have any stories from baseball? One, you, you played one, with my dad, didn't you? I did. I, I did play. I played against your dad. Uh, your dad was a uh, he was a very intense individual, uh, as you know. And uh, I was. I think my first time I ever pitched for the Barons. Terry. Terry was lead off Terry senior was a lead off hitter for the caps and Terry, I walked him and, uh, I was pissed off that I walked him and I looked over at first base and I swear to God, he was halfway down to second base. <laughs> and, lead off and I actually had enough time. Like, and that's how confident Terry was. That was uh, confident. He, and he, should, bases, but yeah. he should remember this, but he didn't realize there was a 15 year old who could turn a, turn on a dime on, on the mail. And I just, I didn't even, I didn't even turn. I just stepped off through the first and picked him up. And he looked at me like, he looked at me like, you little son of a bitch. You're not supposed to throw over here and pick me off. Anyway, <laughs> Uh, we had some great battles. Like, I know I've, 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 I've beamed him a few times because he was that type of player. Um, but again, I, when you have the baseball in your hand, you, you're in, you're in, you know, you have the power. Hey, you both. And, uh, yeah, you, you were. Sorry, go ahead. 
similar players. We were very similar, very heated players. We, we gave it all every time we were out there. Um, I, I'm not afraid to say I worked harder at baseball than I did at hockey. And Darren, and, you you guys I, weren't naturally both well. You could naturally pitch, but I don't think like you're you're like him in that way. Like if the Caps played seven, Dad would go in for a couple games for sure. I know you ended up being a, a more important pitcher, but like right off the hop, I think you guys are real similar. You're you're good hitters. Um, there's a lot of similarities. You're you're a little bit bigger, but you 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 know you both hit left. You could both steal no, bases. I was a righty. I was a righty. Oh Jesus! Yeah, you hit right, yeah. don't you? Yeah. Yeah, but again, no. Again, we we we, we did it all. And again, like it's we are you're athletes, and you're you're. I pitched, I caught, and uh, that was my two roles. But uh, again, playing against TR uh, senior, it was it was it was so much fun because they had such great teams, and they had uh, um, they were an intimidating group. Because when I started, I was only 14 years old with the Barons, and these guys had won a lot, and I was kind of like. All right, I don't want to, you know I don't want this to go on any longer. So luckily, myself and Frank Humber were coming up with the group. Frank uh, coming Humber, up the, the uh, AAA player for those that don't know from Newfoundland. Right. Uh, so Frank Frank actually started with Barons when he was 13. He had to pitch Game Seven in, at uh, St. Pat's, and they ended up losing. And that was the last time he lost for a while. 13. But um, 13 years old. So they pulled that one out of the. Uh, out of, out of the, the bullpen there, but again, it was just uh, it was dog eat dog, right? And there, for uh, those, who, yeah, those out there listening, it is like the, so. The senior league around here is pretty good, and people do there. Are, there are people that get scholarships. This guy Frank Humber we're talking about um, ended up. I don't know if he got drafted, did he? But he played. He did um, the Dodgers. Yeah. He got drafted by the Dodgers, and he played uh, all levels, single A, double A, uh, triple A. And there's another guy from here, Gerald Buck, got drafted to the Yankees and the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, I mean, um, Gerald's story is incredible. Yeah, well, he went to the National Baseball Institute, just, and Gerald was, was real good. Yeah. But, you know, or, or he wasn't generational. I'm not t- knocking at him. I'm just saying he got that opportunity. He went to the National base. I'm not saying I'm any better. He was the best for his fucking age. I'm saying if Darren had that, you know, it just wasn't on anybody. You, you just weren't even, no. My dad wasn't even thinking. He had to go to the Nationals. The only reason Dad got offered... You know, to go away is because he went. You know, you go. It's one thing to do locally. Yeah. Now a lot of things, you, people knock the cover off the ball. Now you go to the Nationals and you see a guy throwing ninety and they don't, they hit zero. Yeah. You know. But the, the boy, anyway, without getting too far into baseball, I just wanted to make that clear. And uh, Darren's one of the best ever. Darren, why do you think your time? Is there anything that you want to throw in about Scotland going overseas and getting that opportunity, and to play in all places Scotland? I know you played in Germany too, but tell me more of the Scotland story. Scotland was a great, uh, great experience because it was uh, it was kind of like a European AHL, and uh, it was a situation where uh, I went over there. I had a great opportunity. Wolfie got me over there again. So uh, again, it's just guys bringing uh, guys bringing guys that they know, um, and I got over there and. For whatever reason, uh, it, it just it was it was just like a real pro atmosphere. Uh, you know, I had guys that played in the NHL. Sean Byram, uh, he was there. He played with the Islanders for a while. Um, they had a couple guys that played in LA's organization. It was just a real great league. Now, I only played, I think I only played 10 or 11 games there. Um, I had an opportunity, and this was what came up. I had an opportunity back in North America uh, for a player assistant coach job in Raleigh, and I I had to jump ship. So I said, uh, you know what, my career is not getting any uh, longer here, so or not getting any shorter. So I said, you know what, I'm going to try and uh, make, a, make a go of this coaching thing. So I got an opportunity there, and I jumped ship, but um, bad move because they end up winning the championship that year. Well, so it's, uh, it was again, it was a great experience while I was there. What a great! It was very similar to here. People welcomed me with open arms. Uh, scariest thing about Scotland was we used to, uh, and we, we were the only team from Scotland. Everybody else was from Great Britain or Cardiff because Gilly Gilly played in Cardiff at that time. Um, Todd Gillingham, and when when you went to the the the. the <laughs> The national anthem we would stand on our blue line the other team would be facing you on the on their blue line and it would be just silent you could hear a pin drop and i don't know if you guys have ever if you ever want to google it sometime google the scottish national anthem and it's like right at a braveheart and everybody, everybody's, just, everybody's just standing on the blue line all of a sudden all the fans start in this low voice. They start singing the national anthem. We never had a person sing the national anthem all year. The fans sang it. Wow. So the first time that you see the t- team on the far blue line looking around, as the, as if all the f- three thousand fans are singing the national anthem, they're like, "Holy fuck, what's the game going to be like?" Let alone, wow. you know, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty intense. That it was sounds pretty haunting. Deep. That sounds pretty. Uh, it that's, was. That's, that's, an, that's an intimidating home ice there. 
Yeah. Um, no, it was. It was incredible. Okay, so I really appreciate you coming this long, and I'm going to wind it down with just one more question. I don't know what you, these guys got. Yeah. And Darren, thanks for all the time. But what I was going to ask is just get back to whatever whatever story it's going to be from John Brophy. Or, oh. or any story, but... No, it's a Brof. Yeah, it's, Brof's it's nuts. Brof. I, want, I want you to tell one because he's fucking nuts, boys. Listen to this. Oh. I don't even know what you're going to no. say. Uh, no, it's um, – Brof was uh, – he, he coached in Hampton Roads, which is in Norfolk, and he always had the toughest team. Uh, when I got traded to Richmond, I, I heard about the the, the Brof uh, legend of, you know, he'd skate by and he'd look at you and his face would be just bright red, ready just to bust a gasket. Anyway, uh, when we were in Richmond, they were our number one rival and we were the closest. So we used to always come down the morning of the game for a skate uh, and – it happened quite a few times that uh, Hampton Roads had lost the night before. So Ro- Brof's rule was if Hampton Roads lost the night the, the night before on the pregame skate, the only way that you're getting off the ice is you had to fucking check the glass out of the boards and go through the glass in order to fucking get oh. off the ice. So we go there early. Our coach, Roy Summer, said, boys, Hampton Roads lost last night. Let's leave a couple hours early so we can get there to see the end of their fucking practice. So we'd all stand. <laughs> Who thinks we of would, this? We would all stand up. We would stand up in the corner. And these and we knew a lot of these guys because we played them fucking all the time. And they're like looking at you like Vic Gervais, who's the classiest guy you ever met. He was on Oral Team Canada with me, Vic Gervais. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah, Roller hockey, the, yeah. Anyway, looking at Vic out there skating and the glass. No, this is not the glass that they have now. This is like plexiglass that you can fucking knock out of the out of the stanchions. Yeah. So, but but to see Dave Morissette and fucking big galutes just trying to fucking go through glass, and I mean hitting it, I mean hitting it and fucking bouncing back ten feet trying to get through it, trying to make a doorway. And yeah, it was fucking unbelievable. Like we'd be standing there like, and it was just like a show. It was like, oh no, did you see that? Some guys would end up in a third row. And be, oh, oh, it was unbelievable. I knew it was going to be a crazy fucking story with John Brophy, though. Who, who, how, did, how did he come up with this? Where did he think, like, well, you know what, I'm going okay. to gonna teach you guys a lesson. You're not getting off yeah. the ice until you. Yeah, well, if you want to if you want to lose at home the night before, if you don't want to ever do this again, this is, this is what you have to Holy avoid. Holy shit. I, yeah. I heard he skated guys at 3 in the morning and everything. I've heard of, so I heard for years, our coach once, Bob Laux in the Western League, we lost in Seattle big time and it was a four hour drive back to Tri-Cities and as soon as we got there we had to put on our gear and practice and I remember like that was the only time I ever saw Lauxy that mad I've never seen I heard stories but the only way like someone one up me one time like how can you top practicing at fucking two in the morning he's like well you guys had just gotten back he's like Brophy they they lost the game and he made everybody come to the rink at three in the morning so they went home at eleven and slapped, and he made everybody come back in at three in the morning, yeah. practice, go back home, sleep the rest, and then come in for practice. He oh banged my them God. in the he middle added, of the night. He added Not off the bus. Not off the yeah. bus. Did he, did he like call everybody and wake them up and tell them to get the fuck in? I don't the know. Rink? I hear these. Are, uh, anybody I come across that played with them got a new story, and I believe, yeah, who did I hear that one from? Um, no, oh, people, these, these were frequent. This this shit yeah. happened all the time. I can remember I can remember us beating them in Richmond in richmond and he left the fucking he told us said you guys go we're skating so i can remember <laughs> us us leaving and those fuckers were still on our ice out fucking getting bag skated yeah man i used to hear stories like that you know where it was Six. you know where it was i'm not looking at db either wheeling he coached him wheeling or something didn't he because i ended up playing in cincinnati we went into wheeling and it went up and he wasn't coaching but after the game, I heard some stuff. the Oilers, yeah. Yeah, I knew he did. So I, it had been maybe before I was there or something like that. I don't think he was there the night I played against him, but I could be but wrong. The, the other the other one was, uh, again, like I said, I was, a, I was a power play guy. And they used to take fucking, like in, in those days, boys, 3,500 penalty minutes in a year for a team was nothing. So now I looked at I looked at the uh, the Growlers who are in, in uh, St. John's now, uh, our, our senior team had over 600 penalty minutes. I don't think the Growlers have over 600 penalty minutes yet. 50 games in. Isn't it amazing? I don't think it's so. No. Fucking, it's incredible. Well, no, I, I we looked at it. We were talking about it last week because Melindy's got that seven game suspension. Mm-hmm. And Melindy leads the team with 136 penalty minutes. The second guy on the team has 37. Yeah. Melindy yeah, has oh, yeah. 99. Melindy's pins, a total throwback, man. And he's I got love 99 it. minutes more than the current, um, than the, the next guy on the team. Wooden sauce on the phone. 
He's an '80s, he's, he's an '80s '90s guy, definitely. But uh, but Brof, going back to Brof, he said, um, you know, every time they take a penalty and I jump over the boards, he goes, "Oh yeah, Colburn, and you're fucking glee now, aren't you? Aren't you, Colburn?" Just trying to get in my head, right? Every so he time would I go chirp. Forth. He would chirp because that's another thing that a lot of fans don't realize. Like, not every coach, in fact, more don't chirp players than anything. Because some chirp yeah. the ref, some don't chirp at all. But rare to see a coach constantly chirping players <laughs> Brophy yeah. was one of those guys that's, yeah and and, that's I, and, and that year so funny thing that year he coached the all-star game he was the head coach the all-star game and I had to play for him and he fucking hated my guts <laughs> he hated me so anyway just just from just from not you know again he treated me good and all that stuff but just from the Hampton Roads Richmond thing he just didn't like me or and guys that I played with so anyway I go out he puts me out on, he put me on a great line anyway the puck was coming back through the neutral zone and I obviously it was an all-star game and and I you know I may not have been back checking as as well as I should have been he yells out he yells out he goes hey Colburn there you go back checking with your eyes again <laughs> he's he's, he's wow. chirping you he's chirping you in the all-star an game all-star game too <laughs> and, he's my, and, he's, and he's my fucking coach <laughs> anyway. oh that's unbelievable uh, listen that's anyway, God, rest um, his soul. God rest his soul he's he's gone now but Oh yeah, uh, it's all, and, and that was the era, Darren. That was the fucking era, man. Like he he got to the top because that's the way he was, and he went with yeah. the road wave, and you know that's the way the game was. So people adapted accordingly. Uh, I look at him as nothing but uh, a legend, and with uh, total endearment. Uh, yeah. But listen, from my perspective, I, you're on here an hour and a half, man. I really appreciate it. I don't have anything. I, I got a thousand more questions for you. Maybe you can be a return guest like Aaron Ashram. Oh. You're right in our backyard, and you got some great fucking legendary stories. So thank you very much, DC, for coming on the show today. Boys, thanks so much. It was an honor. And like I said, for a B-lister, I uh, hope everybody gets a bit of fun out of this. But uh, I, I, I've loved everyone so far, so keep up the great work. Darren, you're a B-lister with A-list stories, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that matters, right? All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Thanks a bunch. Cheers, See you, buddy. Penny Posh, maternity wear reimagined. Breaking the barriers of style, fit, and comfort that often leave mothers to be uninspired in their new wardrobe, Penny Posh's designs have reinvented a clothing category often seen as disposable, temporary, and unattractive. Well, not with Penny Posh. Check it out. A continuous fit maternity collection from bump to bundle and beyond. You can check them out on Twitter at Penny underscore Posh, on Instagram at Penny Posh underscore maternity, and of course, on their website, www.pennyposhdesigns.com. Penny Posh Designs, maternity wear reimagined. All right, and we're back. And while TR has left us, we've been joined by my dog, Sam, who's down running around in the basement now. She was kind of barking upstairs for a little bit, so I figured I'd let her down. She's been dying to get on the show. Friend of the Big show? Fan. Friend of the show. Big fan. Hey, hello. Uh, and so she, she came down to hang out with us for a little bit. Um, so... Uh, I don't. I, yeah, I don't know what more to say about, I don't know how you <laughs> about the Martian. That. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, well, even just the stuff that we talked about is like the oh baby and the offsides because we kind of rushed through those. Mm. Um, and I'm sad that TR is not going to be here for the hashtag hot take we got this week because I do really want to talk about that, and I think we got to go for it anyway, and maybe float it by him and see how he feels again on uh, Saturday, but. The hashtag hot take that we got was from uh, a buddy of ours, a uh, friend of the show, uh, Adam Benson, who tweeted in saying, uh, I got to find the exact wording of it, because either way, it was it's just... You, you, you look it up. I got to tell, uh, tell a story about Benson uh, okay. right quick here. So on one of the very, very early episodes, I uh, told a joke that a uh, good, good friend of mine used to tell a joke uh, that I didn't want to get him in trouble by outing who it was, because it was a, a joke about an ex-girlfriend of his. Uh, it was when someone closed oh, their no, eyes yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah to it to a blind 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 side hit somebody closed her eyes uh, Benson tells this great joke uh, that any time he was driving in a I guess a stressful situation he would look over and his his ex-girlfriend would uh, have her hands covering her ears and or eyes closed and I think her feet were raised from the ground as well which to me always seemed like a way to invite being like projectiled out of the vehicle but uh, absolutely great guy. Absolutely, 
Well, until he says this. He said... Ah, I've, I've gotten worse from him. The lacrosse-style <laughs> goal shouldn't be allowed. It is not a hockey shooting motion. Oh, I thought... I thought he uh, he chirped me today, too. He called me... Uh, he told me I was, like, absolutely... He chirped me earlier today about the, the playoff format. I thought you were going with that. No, I was going with the one he actually hashtag hot Oh, he actually used the hashtag, yeah. He used the actual hashtag, hashtag hot take. And, um, yeah, no, I think... Like, here's the thing. It's it's dumb, and I don't like the lacrosse-style goal. I think, if anything, my issue with it is less about it not being, like, a shooting motion mm. and more with it essentially being traveling. <laughs> You know, like to me, it's more. Are we just going to bring every fucking sport besides hockey and their rules? Lacrosse, traveling. Well, no, but it's just, it's just that, yeah, it's, it's that, you know, like I, I just, I just think the carrying the puck, you know, it it, it all depends on how much carrying the puck you're doing. And it's just one of those things that's grown out of the last little while, obviously. It it has, yeah, it's blown up. I've seen it called offside a couple of times. Evgeny Malkin, when he was uh, just entering the the league, used to like to carry the puck around defensemen by doing that. And the refs would blow it offside because you've got to maintain control of the puck before you. And they would blow it offside. And I think... uh, and I'm not inviting the league to do this because I fucking hate the offside controversies as is. I was uh, watching the Matt Duchesne crazy offside goal the other day. Cause, oh, you uh, mean the one that, that yeah, actually well, gave that, us this whole well, stupid rule and stuff? One of my friends, uh, this isn't really a hashtag. You bring up Matt Duchesne and say yeah. it's like walking away. Yeah, I, yeah, I, there, I've there raised his Sam. dog well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of my friends brought up, uh, I don't know if this is a hashtag hot take or uh, they, didn't, they didn't hashtag it, but uh, they said that Matt Duchesne is forever cursed to never succeed because it's his fault. Yeah, we I saw have that to too. Deal. Yeah, 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 I yeah. saw that too. And uh, I, yeah, it's, so uh, for those who haven't seen it, it's me and Mike looking at one another. We both saw it, but the uh, the line is, uh, Matt Duchesne is forever cursed to not succeed because it's his fault we have to deal with all of these reviewed offsides. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know why it's that we can look at... Uh, a, a, a scorer coming in on the wing and roofing it, and you can pick out his nostril hairs, or if you're <laughs> Lanny McDonald, you can count his fucking mustache hairs, and then when they're reviewing something involving any of the lines, it's like a camera that captured Sasquatch in the <laughs> 1980s. It yeah. drives me. Yeah, and, and meanwhile, they're talking about trying to bring in some sort of, like, sensor so that you can... Uh, uh, you know, have, have seen, smart pucks and shit. I've it's seen just, the sensors before. They're at Walmart. They go off whenever they feel like it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. It's just <laughs> although they've had the te- like. The thing is, how many lines are going to be like a cashier at Walmart? It's like, no, it's fine. It happens. Go on. Go by. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, what I don't understand is they've had the uh, they've had the ability to do this in tennis for like. 10 years, but I believe it's triggered by the impact of the ball hitting, yeah. so I don't think that works. No yeah. one's, unless you're dribbling over the lines. I don't. But then uh, you're not in control of the puck, so it's offside. Anyway. Well, either way, I, I just think I just think it's something where, like, the whole idea that it's not a, a sh- like a hockey shooting motion is just silly. Like, I, yeah, I, I don't like them, mainly because I can't do them. Um, <laughs> but it's just, you know, and, and it's something where, obviously, you got to be careful with a high stick, and, and really, I just don't like any time someone's just swinging a stick around Fair any enough. higher than they have to. But if you're behind the net and you can scoop up the puck and do this... That's pretty fucking cool. It's, it's I, cool, I but jump also off, just like, I jump off the couch when I see it. That's, I know, it's rare. It's also never happened in the NHL. And I think the first guy who actually does it and pulls it off the NHL is going to have his bell rung. Like, it's going to be worse than... <laughs> it's oh, gonna, the Thomas Hurdle thing? You well, think it's no, going to be worse gonna than be, that? I, I think, yeah, oh, Sam thinks Sam's so. Barking yeah, at Sam me. is not feeling this Thomas Hurdle thing. Um, Are you Marty Buran and Doug? Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it's going to be a case of uh, it is gonna, it is going to be a case where it's like what Tr just said about like the the Brad Marchand thing, where it's just like all it is is just giving the other team a reason to hate you and your team so you're, and stir up shit. So you you're against. I think, I think it's a hot you're dog. Pro, thing. Yeah. You're pro tweets, but you're against actually hot dogging on the ice. Well, yeah, I think it's it's. I don't think. What it, if the, Brad Marchand's the guy doing it? What if yeah, Brad Marchand's no, I, the guy? I, it's the thing. It's it's a thing where I. Uh, 
I don't think you should like we can ban it or say that it's whatever. I just think for something I just I just personally don't like it, but I don't think there's any reason to make a rule about it. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a cause of enough concern to like make it an actual rule in the league. That's I agree. I, I think that for something that we haven't seen, uh, with exception to like I think one guy tried it in a shootout, and you know you might see it in warm ups or like yeah. in the HBO twenty four sevens or whatever. Why are we wasting our time even talking about it any longer? Than this, let alone yeah. bringing it to the NHL GM's meetings, yeah. which are happening right now. Actually, some crazy rules that they're talking about bringing in here. Uh, uh, let's, let's hear it. Let's yeah, hear it. so the ones I've read today, I by the way, I'll preface this with saying this shit is like Christmas to me. <laughs> Honestly, this is my favorite, like, because they think of so much crazy stuff. Well, three on three became a, you know, a, a, yeah. a reality because which of I, these uh, meetings, which well, one, here, here. that is, oh my God, three on three. And I think we are going to eventually get it extended three on three into 10 minutes before we go to the shootout and what what a what are gift you, what, what are, a gift what are you ta- what are your thoughts on this torch thing the torch thing go until they die go until they die uh, three on three till they die i don't here's my thing on that the season's long enough these guys are they're faster bigger stronger than they ever have been before adding Anything like that going to you die. Adding anything like that is just going to uh, injuries. That's all. Anytime I hear something like that, I just think injuries. Well, here, I don't want to see an increase in injuries. Here's, so. here's, here's my thought on the whole thing. Yep. I hate the fucking loser point. Yeah, the loser point has to go. Yeah, I hate the fucking However, loser point. However, going to you die. Like, Here's my compromise right. is what I'm saying. I hate the loser point, and I hate that. What I love, though, is that this is coming from John Tortorella, somebody who has. Incredibly balanced, man. No, but somebody who has actually gained from the fucking loser point. Oh, okay. Like, John Tortorella is currently, with him and Peter Laviolette are back and forth right now over who is the winningest coach, U.S. born coach in NHL history. And the reason that he and Labs are both up there so high, the reason that guys like Carey Price are racing to meet Jack Plant's number so fast, the way Roberto Luongo is uh, is is up there so high on the uh, on the wins. Uh, list is that there's no longer ties. So because there's a loser point, every game now is a win or a loss. And so when you're coming to winning as coach or winning as goaltender, it's all like you're playing in an era where every game is basically a win or a loss. You no longer have the ties that guys like mm. Patrick Waugh had, that guys like Jacques Plante, the guys like any of the other guys on that list. Um, even Brodeur only had a few years at the end of his career that were like that. Most of the other guys that are even in the, in the conversation were retired so I think that what you do is if you're going to do it like you said extend it to Berdur, 10 minutes I, I, and then just fuck it no shootout I think for 10, 10 minutes and then fucking tie game no 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 don't bring back the ties fucking I cannot tie game. no fuck that don't bring back the ties Mike how many shootouts have you seen this season what's that how many shootouts have you seen this season well none because I turn it off because it's stupid are you, but like how many times have you been watching a game and it's like oh it's going to a shootout I haven't seen one no Honest. it's not not many but yeah. not so many, if you add it to 10 minutes yeah. if you add it to 10 minutes we could I'm not going to say potentially I'm going to say likely if you oh, yeah. add if you add overtime to 10 minutes 3 on 3 yeah, yeah. we're probably likely going to see less than 5 shootouts in a year Sam agrees Sam doesn't she's disagreeing with you she's saying shut the fuck up I, Don't, no, ties. no ties no ties no I think oh. I think that's it is, is what I, other sports league do you get a tie in Michael but that's leave all. the ties at tip top tailors I think oh <laughs> fuck you um no but here's the thing is is I think in a, like I'd rather a tie than a loser point, and I think oh, that yeah, no, kill and, the I, loser and point. I think that kill I, the and I think 110%. that it's skewing. I think that the the overtime win um, and the like the overtime win going into like not even the loser point, but the the shootout thing where every game now is win or lose that way like I just I, I think I think fuck it like just get rid of the shootout it's no. just stupid well, just 10 minutes it'll t- likely take care of it you have a handful of ties a year you likely take care of it dude that's this, what you just said no. 10 minutes of 3 on 3 yeah, will but likely if, take care if, of the problem if it doesn't there has to be a rule no, so if I'm it saying, doesn't that's it it's a tie game no man. no ties absolutely not no ties <sighs> Oh, I cannot stand the idea of a tie. I, I cannot what stand the idea What is less rewarding of... than watching a so a 70-minute game at yep. this point? And it's like, how'd your team do last night? They didn't win. They didn't lose either. It worked for... What? The, it, oh, no it way. For, no. Like, it worked for 80 years of the league. Uh, terrible. 
to, yeah, but that's not honestly a fun game. Me and uh, I just think it skews. I think it also skews stats. I think anybody now who gets the winningest coach or uh, or, or win, most wins is you're going to put the asterisk by asterisk. Oh, fuck that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Look what. How did we get here from the lacrosse thing? Um, because it, because you talk, mentioned people doing it in the shootout. Oh, I was talking about the league changes coming yeah, from and then the, it was the GM changes. meetings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's two of them that All I right. read today. That so uh, this is an interesting one because it's it, once again every year some stuff comes up that owners mm-hmm. and all of the people shelling out these mega 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 mega, mega contracts or paying for people mm-hmm. don't want these people to get hurt. Uh, so they've proposed a rule that if your helmet gets knocked off in play, you make a beeline to the bench. That's dumb. I think it's a bit it's up there with another hashtag hot take. We have what we heard if your stick breaks. Um, oh Jesus! You just That's my go. roommate. That's Zach. Yeah. Oh Jesus! Yeah, no, it, it, I, was, yeah it was. It was if your stick yeah, breaks, you make no, a beeline. Make it's it, just, no, no yeah. it's just. However, they, they want that to be a rule, and I think like. Well, I'm gonna. The first thing I'm thinking is, well, I'm. Uh, I won't lie to anybody. I'm a bit of a grease ball, and yeah. I'll do anything to win. I'm thinking, how the fuck do I find a way to get these guys' helmets off? Yeah. Well, how no. do I go out and? All right, that's their best shutdown defenseman. I'm gonna go in the corner of them, and I'm gonna fucking find a way to get that I helmet think, off every time. I, I think. I think if like rather than the beeline rule, I'd take it. Everyone was treated like goalie. If a helmet comes off, plays called that. I'd sooner that than you have to make a fucking beeline. I don't think we'll get to that. I don't because, think. We'll get to uh, yeah, I think it's I a stupid yeah. concept. Uh, another good one that I thought, and I, I actually enjoy this one, although uh, I saw a bunch of people whining about it. Um, the coach and team uh-huh. should be allowed to select which face-off circle the first power play happens in the offensive zone. So you know how you get to pick. You, yeah. So you get the, you get the power play. You're yeah. going up there anyway. Yeah. The, so it doesn't matter which side of the ice it's blown dead on. You can take the left circle, the right circle. I okay. fucking love that. I do rule. like that idea. I love it. I do like that idea. I love idea. it. Wh- who's wh- what handedness is your center? Yeah. You know wh- how how good is he on each side of this draw? Yeah. What what defenseman are you loading up on that point? Think about the think about how so, much so more the, effective so the, so the Washington. Team, yeah. So the team that is getting the power. Power getting play. the power play. Um, so you're making a power play. You're giving. It's like so when you, they're just getting a little like it's dialed up it's a like little 33, bit. Like 33. It's like when you buy the shaving cream. It's yeah. like now 33. You wouldn't know. You could, yeah. <laughs> neither one of us would know. Now with 33 percent more. Oh yeah, you bick your head. Yeah, you? I do. Oh, I do. Okay. Not today, but I do. <laughs> it's um, kind of. But yeah. Uh, no, I, I actually I like that one. That doesn't. Yeah, sound, I, I really enjoyed it. Everyone that. was whining. Uh, everyone was whining for the and reason. Then what? Why? Yeah, well, what's, see, what's my my them. You know the them. Small brain yeah. whining that this is the Ovechkin rule. Me, guy who likes to see a lot of goals, thinking <laughs> this oh, is the Ovechkin. This rule. is. I was like, holy <laughs> fuck! Maybe he can catch Gretzky's. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, like the that's, way. That's, that's oh the way you man! Do it. I, I won. If they're if they're grabbing one, take that. Um, what was the other one I saw? I think those were the two biggest ones. But I mean, I love the. This is like. They had a research and development camp a few years ago with all this stuff, and that's where the concussion spotters came from as well. And there's yeah. a lot of a lot of cool things that come from uh, come from these GM meetings when it comes to proposed rule changes. I don't like the helmet one. Um, I think they should get a, a, a kind of like a, a guy sitting in the David Hasselhoff lifeguard chair on each one of these lines, calling off sides, like right in the stands, mm-hmm. like thirty feet up. All he's doing is looking at that line and that puck. But I don't think we'll get to that. I like that job as well. I'm very passionate about offsides. All right. Um, the one one that isn't on this, but I just saw something that made me think about it. Oh, they're also saying that uh, penalties in overtime should only be a minute. Fuck that. Uh, Play within the rules, you degenerates. Yeah, no, I think... Uh, that that's that's fucking up someone who's going for the pin pims lead there. Uh, who's going for the pims lead know, in twenty nineteen? Uh, helmets mandatory in warm up. I think that's that's just a gimme. Like that should just be a thing. Um, cap relief for suspended players is being considered. Um, oh fuck that too. No fuck that. Uh, well, that's um, another Washington rule. It's a Tom Wilson rule right there. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And uh, and I mean, there's there's a couple others, but that's the one. But there's one thing here that did remind me of something you did want to talk about, which was an incident that happened. Sam's being weird. Uh, is an incident that happened on Saturday evening in uh, the uh, Calgary. Minnesota oh my game. goodness! Oh shoot! I was hoping we could get to this when TR was I here. I know. I, and if you want, 
It's 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 one that if you want, we can easily wait and chat to him about this. I think it'll be dead by then, though, because we're, we're, you know, yeah, it's this prob- is, I mean, it probably will. But anyway, I just can't believe. Also, this is, as it stands right now, no supplement that's to the not a not a suspendable act. No, I was just going to say Calgary, Minnesota are not meeting in the playoffs right now. Uh, no, they are. Calgary, Minnesota are meeting in the playoffs as of as it stands right now. Who was the? Remind me again, Mike. Who was the uh, the Calgary player that hit this kid? Oh, I can't remember. Um, Make him a Popeye noise. I'm, I'm just going to uh, check their roster, and when I see his name on the roster, it begins with a K. I do know that Hathaway. It was Garnet Hathaway. Okay, that's not a K. Garnet and, Hathaway. Yeah. Garnet and Hathaway. I'm pretty sure that's who it was. It was he, Garnet Hathaway. Uh, he he. I don't know how to describe this besides a pro wrestling move. Yeah, no, it that was, it was, cross it body was block. stupid. And uh, it, he will not have a hearing. Yeah, I saw that. For, uh, it was on Luke Coonan. Coonan, and, that's the K. And, yeah. and so it's something that like I don't think there's any place for in hockey. I think where it works it is a the, bar fight. If a guy is charging at you and you're standing up at the bar having a beer, yeah. it is completely like on you that it's okay for you to take a step back, put your hand up behind him, and smash his face into the well, bar. And that's what it looked like to me. It, was, it looked like in a bar brawl where there's just one guy who's just being like really chill and doesn't want to be in the fight and a guy like comes up and he just like leans back takes a s- sip of his pint face smashes a guy knocks him out and just goes back to talking to the girl on the other side remind That's me what it to like never to me. go to a bar with you for one we have many times but yeah. not, not, not any of these bars no uh, I've only ever seen um, I've only ever, ever been around really like there was one intense bar brawl I was at and it was really just one guy against the whole bar a guy flipped a pay to pay play pool table like you know one of those heavy pool tables without like oh, all yeah. the fuck oh, yeah. a guy flipped one of those um, and then ended up it was at Junctions back when Junctions was Junctions it was a Wednesday night it was a snowstorm me and my buddy were there because he had just broken up with his girlfriend and just needed to go was like I gotta go drink it somewhere so that's where we wound up I gotta go flip a pool table and, and no it wasn't even him and up in the corner what they were showing like the fucking 100 greatest beat downs ever so it was just a bunch of MMA and, and, and boxing and wrestling clips There's and this guy link. and this guy's all riled up he's got he, like he's clearly just like back home from away he's on all kinds of shit double fist and white Russians at one point yeah he gets cut off from the bar he flips the pool table everybody's pinning them down and they got like there's six guys have him pinned down against the steps by the door as you're going up. I'm picturing this man dressed like Bane. <laughs> no, he was. He was. It was. It was, it, it was a, a white and hardy uh, t-shirt. No, it was like it was like light blue jeans, a fucking white shirt with a, with the sleeves just like one one roll up, and a fucking like like puka shell necklace or whatever the fuck it was, right? Um, and, anyway, he's pinned down on the steps, and the bartender just like looks at me and my buddy, and she said, "Like, can you can you watch the bar for a second? And we we're like, "I guess." And so she just goes around and she starts picking up empties while all this is going on, and she gets over by where they have him pinned to the fucking oh, floor, no. and he's fighting against everybody, and she just takes one off a table, smashes it over his head, and knocks him out enough that the the guys holding him can pick him up and throw him out of the fucking bar. Holy shit! It was fucking wild. It was so cool. But that's Happy what that felt like to me. It felt wow. like that was so, the- <laughs> to me. Oh, you you've got a different. To me, it felt like <laughs> Sam. Come on, I'm trying. She here. doesn't like when you raise your voice. I, okay. <laughs> oh, that's what that is that's too. What it is. Yeah. Jeez. No. You've got yourself best friend there, Michael. Yeah. Uh, you watch cool. yourself. We're cool, Sam. We're cool. <laughs> so everybody, be cool. All right. Uh, to me, it's uh, so you, you've. Got, oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, she is not. Yeah, she is not that? having any of this. We're cool. We're friends. To me, it's like uh, Sammy, come here. To me, to me, it's like so. You've got your uh, your reference here. She thinks I'm going to break a bottle over Mike. Uh, to me, it was like a combo order of what's illegal in the NHL right now. It was late. It was from behind, and it was a board slash forearm shiver. Uh, so it's kind of like whenever I go back uh, to my hometown, which has been a very long time right now, there's a restaurant, I hope it still exists, called The Great Wall. Mm-hmm. It's a very lovely Chinese food restaurant. You can go in and get a combo three. <laughs> and uh, so that's a combo three. Yeah. You get your egg rolls, being it's it's late. <laughs> you get your chow ming, being it's from behind. And uh, if you're me, you really like the, uh, the sweet and sour pork, which is... Uh, uh, it's a board, so it's a combo of of everything illegal. And I think I honestly think the Department of Player Safety was like, 
God damn, it's bold, but you got to give it to him. At well, this no, point. Again, and again, I don't, I don't think that it was any of the things that you just said. It like, I mean, it's a, it, it should be illegal. It's just, I think it's one of those things that it's like, well, there's not actually a rule for slamming a guy's face into the boards <laughs> that way. Um, but I don't think it was, I don't think it was late or from behind because it was kind of from the side. It was literally a case of he was just trying to like push the guy, like he ducked the check and tried to like, like, and it was just. I think, I think a big part way, of it was, it was fucked. Is I yeah, I don't know. I can't. I, I can't understand why that wasn't a suspension. I can kind of, and a lot of people compared it to Chara Pacioretty. I can kind of understand why that. That was different. That was full speed into a stanchion. Well, that yeah, was but the, the both of the both of the things that you can kind of draw a parallel to here is, well, if the player that that got hurt didn't position themselves in such a way at the last second, it yeah. wouldn't have been that bad. He wasn't. Well, that's the same he thing. wasn't intending to hurt. And that's the same thing they said about uh, Evander Kane and Chara, where where Chara came in and it was just the Department of Player Safety didn't do anything because they said that, that, you know, Chara is a half a foot taller than him. Kane was prone because of the way he was. Chara, that that wasn't the, the, it wasn't the intended point of contact. It was just what it was. And, and, you know, good on Evander Kane for knowing he took a hit to the head and getting up and going, well, now I got to take a shit knocking from Zidane Chara to prove my point. And I, actually doing I, I it, didn't like, like that one either. I thought, like, did I think, oh my goodness, throw the book at him? No. Give it a game. Give it a game. Remind everybody, hey, you're not allowed to fucking cave people's skulls in. It's real bad. Charo's, what, 40? 41? Yeah. He'd have welcomed a game, man. <laughs> he'd have loved it. He'd have, been, yeah. he'd have showed up at the rink. He would have sat in the hot tub room, read the I, paper. I think, I know, I, I, I still, I think it was. Just give him a game. That's no, all. but like, I think it's also a precedent thing. And that's the, and I think that's it. Is that like at this point, it would have been a case where if that was any player who wasn't Zidane Ochara, it wouldn't have been that kind of. It wouldn't even have been close to being mm-hmm. like a, a high hit or whatever. Mm-hmm. And at this point, you're just you're giving a guy a game suspension. It means he's taking a fine with it as well and forfeiting salary oh, or goodness, whatever the fuck it is. My goodness, well, nobody's doing all that, and you're doing that just because he happens to be six foot nine. He should and be. He, he should be aware on what part of his body is going to cave a man's skull in. And, uh, and the same thing was I but, wasn't but, trying to hit but someone. But the other with thing is stick. that Evander Kane should also be aware that there's that guy. Coming Coming around them, and if you want to try to defend against yeah. somebody built like Zidane Chara, you get some pitchforks and you get some torches and you do it in the traditional way, and you chase them up to the top the, of a yeah, fucking windmill and light it on fire. The beginning of Shrek. Like fuck, but like, anyway, that's where we won't get into that. We won't. And that that's gonna. I gotta. When's the last time you seen a Boston Bruin suspended? The forties? You gotta go back to the World War era. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. I'm telling you, man. Shut the fuck up and get out of my basement. <laughs> oh, your dog is gonna escort me over. I think she is. I'm I think she's going to have my ankles here. Yeah, and as as well, you should be. She's vicious. She's also wearing a Bruins tag, so oh, that's, you know, um, watch out for her. The SPCA on <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on that note, though, I think we will uh, call this one. Uh, thanks so much again to Darren Colburn for coming on and chatting with us. It was great to have Tr back, and we'll be back again pretty quick. Yeah, uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, less than, it's, uh, less than it's a week Tuesday now. now. We'll be back on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, so keep an eye out. Uh, so if you're hearing this, probably Thursday. Uh, you're probably listening to it while Charles is at the Duke. My We're favorite have an day of the week. We're having an announcement of our guest coming any minute now. Um, and we'll be recording really soon. So keep an ear out. And thanks so much for listening, following along, liking. Uh, thanks, of course, to our sponsor, Head Check Health. Thank you to all of you for all the, the good stuff there. And uh, we'll be back next week to shout at you about hockey. Why See you later. You